Yeah. Hello, everybody. Hi. Welcome to this. Uh, we are in unprecedented times. And now uh, the challenge on the ENT surgeons is, is, is immense. We have to do a complete debridement of the necrotic tissue. And so that our curve of excellence, of reaching that excellence, becomes the shortest possible this effort. Our uh, beloved CM, the very scientifically minded man, has uh, urged upon us. So we thought we'll create 100 warriors. But to people are responding to his call, I think we've got more than 180 already and more are wanting to come. Okay. So we will do this probably twice a week and Satish is kind, Ashim has also taken his time to share the experience. At some point we have Dr. Sethi who's going to come in from Singapore to add to our surgical skills. Uh, but before that we have the pleasure and privilege of having Dr. Oak who is the chairperson of the task force of Maharashtra. And I believe the way COVID has been handled in Maharashtra it, it, of course, has got praise from the Prime Minister himself, but all over the world, I think they are praising for what could have been a terrible tragedy in Mumbai uh, with the experience and wisdom of Oak Sir and his team. And the way the administration have actually listened, there are many areas where there are experts, but then somehow it doesn't translate. So, I we are thankful to you, for the safety of all the citizens of Maharashtra, and we all remain protected. And thank you for supporting this. We are doing our best and we promise you that the ENTs will do their very best, whatever area you need us to be. So you could say a few words about before we begin. Thank you, Ashish. Yeah. Uh, dear friends, uh, very pleasant good afternoon. And I think uh, this is an important mantle that you have decided to shoulder. COVID for the last 14 months has gone through various phases. It was an unknown enemy, completely uncharted bastions that we have been trudging upon. And then, well, one medicine after other. And then all of us, surgeons as we have been, we're doing anything except our own domain surgery. I think COVID for the first time has given an opportunity to a surgical domain to perform work in their own field. And that is your field, ENT. And I feel that... Maharashtra is facing significant number of cases. The official reported figure is to the tune of approximately about 1500. And I fear that this figure is just the tip of an iceberg. The so yesterday, is pardon me? The mucor cases you are saying 1500? Yes, yes. Whatever I am speaking today is mucor. in the context of mucor mycosis. So I fear that there are many more behind them who have not yet come to the surface. And I think I would say in your own words, Ashish, has formed there, which we need to endoscope mm -hmm. and see mm -hmm. right across, in all across the frontiers of the state. So yesterday, mm -hmm. there was a special task force, state task force meeting on the topic of mucormycosis. A paper has been developed with the inputs of everybody and a protocol has been laid down as how one should approach it in the management. So we have made an appeal that every patient who is in ICU and ready to go home eventually, every patient who has classified himself into the high risk category of COVID should be subjected to a consultation from an ENT surgeon. If he wishes, preferably once in a week, yesterday, in fact, people actually say twice in a week, be subjected to the procedures of nasal endoscopy. Ashish yesterday came out with a suggestion of even a brush biopsy prior to a formal debridement and we sending the material for biopsy. MRI, obviously, Ashim was making very valid points. And the paper that Maharashtra Task Force has circulated, a little exhaustive one, almost about 14 pages, talks about all the features of T1 and T2 weighted images of MR, because these things are relatively unknown yet in the interiors of Maharashtra, as far as the radiologists are concerned, and even maybe the ENT colleagues are concerned. Today morning, I had a talk with Honorable Health Minister and Honorable Chief Minister prior to their meeting with Honorable PM. And I think it is clear that the next week is going to be a mucormycosis and ENT concentration week. 
and this particular meeting on that background is very very significant you also go across the paper because that paper of the task force is being circulated all across the state today so the various medicines the dosages the combination therapy the salvage therapy what if lyophilized variant of as of uh, as active uh, the, the antifungal is not available what do you choose whether posoconazole has any role prophylactically and as a supportive or as an adjuvant every possible thing has been discussed but the fact remains that good surgery has no substitute and i think surgical debridement by an ent surgeon is now in the forefront if you want to save lives out of nasal mucor going into brain or a pulmonary mucor or a renal mucor or a gi mucor all these things have been seen in our country so i won't be long i wish you all the very best and ashish after the two days events of today and saturday let's talk again on sunday when i will further update the advisory with all possible suggestions included all the best to you thank you only one point thank you sir thank you we are in unprecedented time see mucor surgery was a well standardized protocol but now the absence of an anti mucor drug i think we are trying to increase our margins of uh, debridement and this is what we are going to come out with that area of suspicion ho ka nahi karu ka nako i think with the uh, another four or five days so this next five days we may be doing a little bit more aggressive but that i'll get satish ashim and you know others to sort of opine and that's the minor change which we may suggest to you so ashish obviously i mean the prevention has to be the first role even by all surgeons like us so one must try and prevent mucor and for that one has to treat covid properly and take care of diabetes and stop unscrupulous use of methylprednisolone and so many steroids but we can't take a second stand of as was suggested yesterday of stop prescribing and drop methylprednisolone from it just cannot be done because then we would lose lives Absolutely. so i think a balance has to be evoked and though we are surgeons we will say that prevention is the first level of treatment of mucormycosis okay. when we fail that this is what needs to be done that's how i think we should say about this thank you thank you sir thank you very much satish ashim you want to say yes actually actually the next uh, to be called upon will be satish jain and his discussion of the mri because i personally feel that till date mri has not been given its due place in the sun for the diagnosis of uh, mucor in covid uh, what is happening is that most people even now are relying upon ct scan alone and that will never allow us to determine the margin of exaggeration and the removal of the uh, debridement that we uh, seek to do fact, and sorry ashir often yeah. it is misleading i have fear that when you base your surgery on ct scan you are actually imagining things rather than seeing things Sorry. that is correct because there is it's almost impossible to determine whether it is mucor or a routine sinusitis along with a covid with a healing covid and that is where the role of mri comes in so the next few minutes i think all should be focused on what satish has to say on the pattern on the protocol that one should follow for doing the mri imaging because unless this protocol is shared with your radiologists also it will be very difficult for them also to interpret because the routine sinus mri or a routine skull base mri is not going to be enough so i will uh, before we go on to satish let us welcome two people who i really appreciate in this world of ent one is dr dharmveer sethi is just uh, logged in from singapore thank you dharmveer for coming uh, welcome to this uh, program a very very warm welcome from all of us here and uh, the chair person for this program dr sameer bargav president of the all india association of uh, otolaryngologists has also logged in so let me welcome uh, both of them hi sameer welcome hi sameer hi sethi sir this is dr sethi that i wrote to you about he he is the master of masters uh, is a teacher of teachers teacher of teachers venturing in the country has been trained by this great man thank you boss thank you for being there and uh, we are going to tax him a lot because fortunately he does not have mucor so unlike me ashim satish and all the ents he has free time and we are going to exploit him hamara haq banta hai iske upar so we are going to say anybody having any issues with reading the mri anybody during surgery having any we will have uh, dr sethi help us out and we will not allow him to sleep boss if you want to say something just you have to say yes 
No, Ashish, just uh, thank you so much for, you know, uh, yeah, getting me on the uh, panel today. It's a privilege to be here. Um, we don't see much of MUCOR at all. In fact, I spoke to um, uh, Leung Ho Nam, who is one of our leading experts on uh, COVID-19. He's on the task force for Singapore. And he said, we haven't had any reported cases. In fact, I did one more than 25 years ago. Uh, it was, I don't even know whether it was MUCOR, but it looks very much like uh, what you described. And at that time, we didn't have MRI. That was a long time back. And uh, we depended hold solely on a CT scan. So I have been following uh, the, uh, uh, you know, Satish surgery and imaging past couple of uh, workshops that he did. Very excited to be here. And uh, if, if I can com contribute something, I'll be delighted to. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Samir, from our association, any few words for you to say before we start with the program? Well, thanks, Ashim, for inviting me for this. And of course, you all are doing a wonderful job in, uh, if I may use the word, enlightening uh, all the ENT surgeons, not only of the city, but the state, the country, and probably even abroad. Because this being a disease that seems to be more endemic in India as of now, I think everybody needs an uh, enlightenment about this. And thanks to Satish and his last two or three uh, uh, surgical webinars, I think uh, uh, now everybody who has attended that is going to do only and only an MRI and, and not just a CT scan. But having said that, I would definitely, uh, probably as a first initial screening, maybe that CT scan is is uh, what is being done uh, because we are also getting at Cooper Hospital a lot of patients from the rest of the uh, state. And we find that most people have done just that CT scan. And then when they come here, then we look at the MRI and really find out how much the disease is actually uh, spread inside. So uh, thanks for doing this wonderful job of uh, educating uh, even the ENT surgeons. And uh, uh, I think over to uh, Satish, I'm not going to take much time. I think everybody is waiting for his talk. Satish, and uh, good afternoon, uh, Dr. Sethi. And good afternoon, Dr. Oak. It's great to see you. Satish, anybody from Haryana AOI wants to say or any of your other person from Jaipur? Mm, I don't think uh, they, they are uh, welcome to in between, anything if they want to. The entire course they can come in. So maybe you yes, can... Yes, sir. Any time, any point of time. So thank you, Ashish and Ashim, my dear brothers, for involving me in this um, webinar. And big thanks to the chairman, Dr. Sanjay Oak, for this great initiative and the team AOI Pune and the chairmanship of ever smiling Dr. Samir Bhargav, AOI Haryana, Dr. Master Blaster, Dr. Sudeep Munjal, Dr. Sanduja, Dr. Upendra Ranga and all that who are involved in this scientific activity. Thank you once again for giving me this opportunity. We always, uh, like in our previous two webinars, discuss a lot about the workup of these patients for mucor mycosis treatment. And MRI, as we all have been discussing, has come up as a principal tool to uh, you know, work up all these patients. So imaging of choice is MRI for certain reasons, which I'm now going to uh, you know, uh, enumerate why MRI is distinctly superior to any other investigation. Why we want to do MRI? This mucor mycosis is a different disease which preferentially invades the vessel and give vascular necrosis. Sorry, get your mic right. Yes. So this mucor mycosis is a different disease which preferentially invades the vessels and give vascular necrosis. Role of MRI, I call MRI in this particular disease as a bioimaging, which truly differentiates the tissue what we are going to deal with. And why we need this differentiation? We want to know the tissue which has got necros because of lack of vascularity so that we can remove it where the drugs are not going to penetrate. And the, the surgery has a principal role in removal of their disease, necrotic tissue, to facilitate the medical treatment, to, to promote the penetration of medical treatment to the viable tissues. So the MRI should be able to differentiate what is necrotic. Any investigation should be able to differentiate what is necrotic tissue which needs to be removed and what is not necrotic tissue. This is one part, one aspect we need to see from MRI. Another important aspect is where all the disease has spread to so that we can plan our surgical approach. We can prognosticate the patient. Patients having minimal disease, you can give a best prognosis. 
as compared to those where the disease has extended intracranially or uh, anywhere to the difficult areas, which is not difficult to remove. And those are the patients carry the poor prognosis. So MRI can clearly, clearly tell you preoperatively how the patient is going to behave by and large postoperatively. Number three, the critical areas involved, which requires special attention during surgery, like orbit. Excentration, clearance of the orbit is totally dictated by MRI. MRI gives, by means of its versatility, by means of its ability to give more than 1,500 sequences, it can really differentiate soft tissue into uh, different, different types. So it gives us amazing information about the uh, patient's vision status, the optic nerve status, Orbital involvement, need of the orbital clearance, need of the orbital excentration, very, very clearly, which I'm going to show you. And if there are any distal spread of disease, which is happening, even before the clinical appearance, if the patient is developing some distal spread, you can warn your patient beforehand, rather than developing that complication later on and finding some medical legal problem. So you can, by means of MRI, preoperatively, you can assume that what complications are going to happen. That is so important. Next is about the vascular spread. This disease has an affinity to spread through vessels. Involvement of the carotid artery, cavernous sinus is not uncommon. And those are the most difficult areas to deal with. And MRI has the ability to clearly appreciate, give information about what exactly is going on with the central circulation and the cavernous sinus and all that. So you can plan your surgical approach and prognosticate your patient accordingly. Yes, but, yes, Archie. Uh, even if the vision is normal and the eyeball movement is good, yes, do you think we can come out with an algorithm or something that MRI yes. is preoperatively and will you dwell on it now? In yes, the... exactly MRI can tell you. That's what I'm going to discuss. Then there are certain areas, as I said, necrotic areas have to be removed to facilitate the medical treatment. There are certain areas where your surgery can lead to a lot of morbidity like involvement of the heart pellet, which is not uncommon. And preoperatively, your MRI can easily pick up and you can tell your patient pre-op that this will need to be divided, which will require later on reconstruction and other treatment and will have some sort of morbidity. And you can, you know, alert your patient beforehand to that treatment rather than giving your patient post-operative number of surprises. So MRI has number of roles to deal with and I am going to... Uh, show you certain uh, first of the uh, first of all the case which we are dealing with today. What are the sequences we need to order for MRI? Because the onus is on the surgeon. If you write MRI PNS, your radiologist will do one or two sequences and finish MRI in five ten minutes. You have to order particular important sequences for particular disease. That onus is on surgeon, and that is what I am going to enumerate. What sequences are important and what information do they give? Um, uh, for mucormycosis treatment. So number one sequence is the fat-suppressed T2-weighted MRI. Fat-suppressed T2-weighted MRI gives us complete information about this inflammatory disease. See, this is infection. Infection is always bright on T2-weighted like any fluid. Any tissue with water content will appear bright on T2. And the second sequence I will compare together is a contrast. These two sequences will give us majority of the information and we can keep them together on if you have a, info, if you have a, a complete data of the MRI and that's why we always acquire our MRI on DVD. So I will put up these two things together and it will give us most, most of the information and how to see that and what all to be seen. As I said, it invades the vessel and gives vascular necrosis. When there is vascular necrosis, whatever contrast material you give, gadolinium, is not going to reach those areas, which are normally enhancing. Now see on this contrast sequence. See the turbinates on the right side. I hope you can see the MRI. Yes, yes, we can see. See the turbinates which are enhancing on the right side. And look at the turbinates and the lateral nasal wall on the left side after gadolinium administration, which is not enhancing which gives you a clear picture what exactly is necrotic tissue which needs to be removed.
so the contrast picture will give you information about the necrotic tissue it is not only the necrotic tissue that needs to be dealt with enhancing tissue also needs to be dealt with because that contains the fungal load but since the gadolinium is reaching so we expect our amphotericin will also reach which is deadly to the mucor so those areas we are not supposed to radically remove to give more and more morbidity rather we can stay conservative on those areas and expect the amphotericin to work on those areas so to avoid unnecessary morbidity of removing everything yes ashish sorry now we are in a phase when we are not having amphotericin for let's say 5 or 7 days yeah how do we deal with these areas so ashish let me tell you this is a medical disease this is a fungal infection this is not a surgical entity role of surgery is limited and very important to remove those necrotic gangrenous areas which can't be dealt with the medicine which are the areas of fungal load which are the areas where fungus uh, has a uh, particular environment the best environment to thrive the acidotic non hypoxic areas where the fungus can spread to the adjacent areas very fast and role of surgery is to deal with those areas rest is a medical disease which you have to deal with the medication No, Unfortunately, but... liposomal amphotericin is temporarily short. We, if we are not going to get the amphotericin or any anti-mucor drug, volume बढ़ा ना? Currently, volume. like maybe hopefully next four or seven days, we are not going to have an amphotericin. Yes. Patients, would you recommend that we also debride this tissue, which is enhancing? Okay. Let me let me tell you what you are trying to say. See this entire infratemporal fossa area, which is enhancing yes. behind. Can you see? Yes. Yeah. If you try to remove everything, you'll end up leaving nothing in that certain areas, and you will end up giving lot of morbidity, which is not a good idea. Amphotericin might be short for the time being. We are facing this crisis, but time being, we have to resort to the alternate drugs, and ultimately, this crisis is going to be over. So don't but that is not. Surgery. Don't overdo the surgery. Stick. Yes, to the yes. That morbidity is significant. you can't remove the entire contents of the infratemporal fossa like anything okay. and leave a permanent morbidity to the patient that is not acceptable okay. so what i'm trying to say this is a contrast picture where you see loss of contrast enhancement loss of contrast enhancement is the sign the area sign of the area which need to be debrided and what you see on t2 weighted mri it is enhancing because it has water content inflammation inflammation is water content which is always enhancing on t2 so keeping these two sequences together you can have a full idea three dimensionally in all planes you can see where all are the necrotic necrotic areas need to be removed so you can plan your approach accordingly i will show you some example where the disease has gone to the superficial skin and you can't uh, remove those cases debride those cases endoscopically and you have to resort to an open approach when it comes to removal of the skin when it comes to removal of the eyelids other facial structure you need to resort to the open approach so this involvement on the mri what is shown on the mri what areas are involved is the surgical approach is dictated by the mri whether you can remove by the endoscopic or open approach or whether it is inoperable according to the surgeon's competence that you can take a call according to the extent of uh, you know necrotic area number 1 number 2 see from anterior to posterior you can see the maxillary sinus maxillary sinus nasal cavity the ethmoidal cavity see this entire ethmoidal cavity is all full of necrotic tissue which is enhancing on t2 and not enhancing on gadolinium then the orbit and the adjacent area need to be seen the skull base see the disease is reaching right up to the skull base you can see right up to the thoracic skull base you can see but not breaching the skull base you can see very well can you see on t2 the yes. skull base yes. bone is completely intact and disease is not transgressing that skull base barrier to invade intracranial structures then posteriorly this is your this is your pterygopalatine fossa region and disease is there in the pterygopalatine fossa you can see the you know the you know the bunch of disease is in the pterygopalatine fossa bunch of disease there and there behind 
behind this is the infratemporal fossa where a lot of enhancing area that is a good sign whatever necrotic under vision you can remove and whatever enhancing area the inflamed muscle you are not supposed to remove what enhancing areas are inflamed areas you will find the muscles in the infratemporal fossa non necrotic but inflamed and we are not supposed to remove that radically we can expect our drug to penetrate those and work there efficiently and this is the pterygoid process area that is the pterygoid process area where the disease is you know oh satish how often in what percentage is the pterygoid palatine fossa involved in your very common very, very common. common more than 70% more than 80% i would say and in advanced diseases particularly when it invades the orbit it is almost always involved and this is one of the avenues to uh, for the uh, the infection to spread to the orbital apex and give early blindness. I will show you the close anatomy of the pterygopalatine fossa, orbital apex, and the cavernous sinus. This one square inch area is the key area where this mu uh, this mucor mycosis spread so fast in no time it gives blindness. In no time it invades the intracranial structure through that uh, avenue through those channels. So this is the spread of the disease in that area. What need to be seen on uh, in these two MRIs. Now the next is sorry, in sorry, sir, sir is there. I want to clarify. This cannot ever be seen on a CT scan. To be yeah, able to predict this, to be able to read this, you only and only need the MRI. Yes, yes. So what I will do? Let me explain the MRI, yeah. and I'll bring the CT scan later, and yeah. I'll ask you to give me what information you can give us. We'll discuss the CT scan later. I will bring some CT picture later of one of these patients. So now come to the orbit. We need a lot of information that this disease has a propensity to involve the orbit at the early phase and give blindness. Even with the minimal disease in the nose and the you know uh, the sinuses and the maxilla, patient present with the blindness because it has an affinity to invade the vessel and central retinal artery occlusion can lead to early blindness. Other way of blindness is involving the orbital structure, involving the optic nerve itself. Inflammation of the optic nerve is the principal region for bringing blindness. And how can you pick up? Sometimes you have a patient who present with blindness. Now you are safe. You have nothing to save. And some of the patients are in the early phase of developing blindness. The moment you start treatment, the next day patient develops blindness and the onus is on the surgeon again. The patient may start blaming you that if after starting my treatment, I developed the blindness. And this can be certainly avoided to a certain extent by means of MRI. You can see what is happening, the level of inflammation in the optic now. For example, this patient, I, I tell you one of the simplest sequence, I must reiterate on this to everyone watching this webinar to get this. You must get this sequence done to pick up the early presentation of blindness, early involvement of the optic nerve and the blindness. Let me show you first and then I'll come back to this. Let me show you one diffusion weighted MRI sequence. Diffusion weighted MRI, I always tell diffusion weighted MRI is a bioimaging. Diffusion weighted MRI is a bioimaging by means of which we can see the molecular diffusion, water diffusion in the tissues water molecular diffusion into the tissue. See this diffusion weighted MRI. Keep an eye. This patient has a blindness on the right side. I'll show you how it is involving the orbit. Simplest of all sequence, diffusion weighted MRI. And what you see, this opting now on this side having infarct. Diffusion weighted MRI is a sequence which can pick up, earliest pick up the infarct. It can pick up earliest the developing infarct even before it, is, it clinically presents. Even before it clinically presents. So you have to assess the entire cranial cavity. See, some, some infarcts developing bilaterally into the temporal lobe. Can you see? Yes. And a big infarct in the optic nerve. Looking at this sequence, I can tell my patient without even looking at the patient clinically, without even asking that the patient is certainly blind. So we must get the diffusion weighted MRI to see the optic apparatus, to see the visual status. And by means of 
visualizing the earliest infarct in the optic now you can certainly say that the patient has lost the vision so even so before impending satish this is already a blind already clinically blind yes but if even you... before the patient says he is not completely blind say i have some diminished vision with no, mucor no, mycosis no, in the orbit okay with mucor mycosis in the orbit and you find the infarct developing in the optic now you can tell your patient you have practically lost your vision and there is no possibility of saving the vision this is irreversible for that matter so diffusion weighted in one sequence we must always get done coming back to the same sequence do uh, these two sequences so we were talking about the orbit now look at on t2 weighted mri in this orbit on both sides can you see the difference in the right orbit and the left orbit uh, yes yes what sequence is this this is fat suppress mri t2 weighted fat suppress mri why so orbit is full of fat on any mri sequence the fat is always bright inflammation is also bright with a fat si uh, signals inside the orbit and inflammation super added you can't differentiate whether it is inflammation sequence or fat sequence so fat signal so what you do this is fat suppress mri where you suppress the fat now whatever uh, high signals are going to be purely related to inflammation got my point Yes. Yeah. Now look at this fat sequence MRI on this side. First focus on the right side, and it is completely non-enhancing. Can you see? Yeah. Now look at on this orbit. Everywhere inflammation. See the deep inflammation at the level of the orbital apex, and I will show you once I explore. I know before I explore that this eye has gone completely necrotic. this orbital apex has gone completely necrotic and most of the regions have gone necrotic by means of showing this inflammatory areas in the orbit and see what happens once you show inflammatory areas some of them are enhancing some of them are not enhancing on contrast which signifies that the mucor has invaded this orbital space and if you go behind see the mucor has completely invaded the orbital apex so this is the case for the orbital clearance which i am going to show you endoscopically not for orbital excentration lot of people even publish in the newspapers that they remove the eye so frequently i need not to be removed so frequently in less than 10% of our huge series of cases we need to excentrate only when the outside structures the eyelid and the globe is directly invaded then only you need to do an orbital excentration that is two radical procedure which were initially developed for uh, treatment of the malignancies involving this area this particular disease the concept is different we have to remove only those necrotic areas where the drugs are not going to reach and to preserve those areas healthy areas vascular areas where the drug can have its own effect so here we will be doing a orbital clearance now sorry sorry i mean Folks, yes. so enucleation is very, very rarely required in a mucor case. Enucleation is a different word, Ashish. Enucleation is removal of the eyeball. Yeah. Here we are not concerned with removal of the eye. Our concern, again, don't deviate from our aim. Our aim is to remove the necrotic tissue, whatever it comes. If the eyeball is necrotic, I have to remove it. Sure. So rather than using terminologies of excentration, enucleation, evisceration. the best and appropriate terminology is removal of the necrotic tissue whatsoever it is and for that even if you have to excentrate we have to do that if the outside structures like eyelids and the skin is involved not for the involvement of the retroorbital tissues that you need to do orbital excentration always I'm trying to bring forth the limited role of an oculoplastic surgeon in mucor we almost don't need them almost that absolutely was absolutely absolutely now another um, uh, way of looking at the vision whether the patient how the patient vision is going to be look at the other side can you see right from the beginning see this is globe this is optic now can you see yeah, yeah. on the right side what is there on the left side see the what is this white uh, uh, hello around the optic now optic now is here in the in the center what is this white hello is a peri optic csf space 
the optic nerve carries the meningeal sheet right up to the globe we all know and this is the sheet which is full of csf and that signifies a good signal of the optic nerve csf on the right side which is practically nowhere on the lost it is completely lost see anteriorly just behind the globe it starts and then it fades off completely gone you can see on the right side intact but it is completely gone you can i can follow it to the level of the chiasma this is chiasma optic chiasma and see on this side see this is the optic now this is the optic now and this is completely gone by this side you can see the optic now so this is third way third way of you know assessment of the orbit number one diffusion weighted to see the optic nerve in fact number two fat suppressed uh, mri to see the intensity of inflammation in the orbit and the areas of the inflammation into the orbit and number third on the t2 weighted mri is the peri optic csf space by means of these you can you know prognosticate the vision and uh, you know, plan your surgical approach to the orbit and in such a case again my approach would be intra orbital you know endoscopic orbital clearance rather than an excentration so this is not the case for the excentration this is the second thing that you need to see on a mri now you know when this was this i already mentioned the earliest in any case you will find this sign black turbinate sign so whenever you start you know looking at the mucor in mind must look at the turbinate the turbinate which is non enhancing black turbinate sign is the earliest one and that is classical for the mucor mycosis now some of the areas which i will show which is not in this particular patient which need to be assessed in every case like for example the involvement of the cavernous sinus involvement of the carotid artery flow i will show you some examples intracranial infarcts if they are you have to counsel your patient for that prognosis we have couple of patients whom we have been treating for mucor have already developed intracranial infarct uh, with much uh, i mean not much of the symptoms that you have to keep in mind for prognostication so some of the examples i am showing from different patients on the mris and then involvement of the soft tissues involvement of the palate you can completely predict as i said so one by one first of all i will take the cavernous sinus involvement okay so this particular patient let me show you the minimal involvement of the cavernous sinus this is a revision case uh, operated somewhere where the lots of disease behind let me show you first what is the status of the disease after the surgery look at this look at this the disease removal during primary surgery almost nothing has been done and see this is all non enhancing area the skull base and the most important is this non enhancing area this is greater wing of the sphenoid this is pterygoid and the sphenoid bone which is the most dreaded area most difficult area which needs to be completely debrided and we all know the carotid artery cavernous sinus in the close vicinity at the orbital apex this is the most most uh, difficult area now see as i go behind this is the carotid artery this is the carotid artery and this is the disease right into the cavernous sinus how to know whether the cavernous sinus has undergone thrombosis i will let me show you the axial picture look at this axial picture on this side can you see the difference on both sides yes see the carotid artery and the cavernous sinus on this side and what is happening on this side you lost the signal no enhancement and this is a classical example of the cavernous sinus thrombosis and keeping this uh, fact this in mind we need to you know start early the anticoagulants operating on these patients is a dual challenge with anticoagulants or you know need to be started early as early as possible to prevent uh, the further thrombotic episode so this has to be seen on every mri on every mucor patient you are treating whether it is a minimal disease or extensive disease because it has a you know tendency to invade vessels very early in the course see what i am showing on mri in detail it is the onus on the surgeon to see himself don't rely on the radiologist too much 
radiologists don't have time to explain you hours and hours believe me they will just write a report of you know this thing this this, this area is involved how surgically it is relevant is you have to uh, correlate so we have to develop this habit of reading mri one on to improve our results to predict and to prognosticate the patients well so this is the cavernous sinus thrombosis and this particular patient see this the entire non enhancing area in the disease is right invading the cavernous sinus right invading the cavernous sinus which is the herculean task to remove it and we are going to do it soon so probably we'll keep in one of the webcast we are we are we are, we are showing the variety of cases pardon what surgery was done before from this patient mucormycosis surgery acha you can interpret yourself but this is mucormycosis surgery now uh just a minute i will show you some important uh, you know one of the biggest fallacy is quick the surgery is that when no, no. Often no. Often no. during surgery the yeah. posterior wall of the maxilla appears normal and therefore the surgeon stops there not knowing what is lying in the pterygo palate and fossa and towards the infratemporal fossa so that is the value of the mri in most of these cases as satish earlier said 70 to 80% of cases the posterior wall of the maxilla should be removed to examine the contents of the pterygo palate and fossa and going laterally to the infratemporal fossa because that is the residual disease that's where it grows back from so there are lots of things to be assessed on mri for your uh, you know overall treatment everything is important prediction and the prognostication is an integral part of the, your overall treatment otherwise failure to do so failure to do so can take you any time in the medical legal complications so this patient very interesting had see uh, let me show you first the disease profile this is a post surgery can you give me the other one the pre surgery yes see this is post surgery the clearance can you see yeah can you see the clearance everything yep no, now let me show you pre surgery there is an important point to keep in mind because these patients have to be dealt with oh come on yes so this patient had carotid artery occlusion before complete occlusion of the circulation on one side with some weakness on the opposite you know limbs and had extensive mucus i have already shown you post op yeah so if i show you this axial contrast mri is opening Uh, it is opening just a moment that's a very interesting finding uh -huh. where is the why well, it's not opening so this patient had a complete occlusion of the carotid artery which i wanted to show you no flow of the carotid artery on one side complete occlusion of the carotid artery on one side and patient presented with hemiplegia hemiparesis so that is one thing we must always keep in mind in such patient the such possibility can always be there and we have to be very very careful now certain examples certain examples of orbital involvement uh, yes certain examples of orbital involvement what we discussed before same picture just to give you repeated information that how predictable it is 
see the T two weighted fat suppressed MRI. Can you see the difference in both the orbits? Yes. See, this is fat suppressed image, and see the kind of inflammation. Kind of inflammation this particular patient is having in the orbit with no optic now signal. See the optic now signal, optic now signal gone. So these are the patient need to be thoroughly assessed with the angiogram. You can get the MR angiogram done to see complete information of the vascular. I would see show you one of the angiogram. This is. See this the infarct in the optic now, on the right side. Can you see? Yes. On the, on the, the, this right side, where the patient has lost vision, and see the amount of disease, and in the right eye, with this much of the inflammation. So orbital involvement requires diffusion weighted, T2 weighted fat suppress, and the perioptic, or uh, CS of space halo, which all are important uh, to assess the orbital involvement. Now the, another important thing. is the palatal involvement palatal involvement is very important the early palatal involvement can uh, you know warn you from uh, regarding the you know uh, reconstruction facility uh, shravan kumar yeah this is the patient probably as a early palatal involvement see if we miss this finding on mri we may not counsel our patient your palate is probably involved and intraoperatively get a surprise that the mucor is invaded the palate and you have to obviously nothing else then but to exenterate the palate and tell your patient post op with a big surprise that we had to remove the palate and now you'll have to undergo some other treatment for the palate in the future see this this is the palate and this is the palatal periosteum the mucosa can you see on the difference on both sides Yes. One yes. side is enhancing, and on C on this disease side, this disease side, the palatal mucosa is not enhancing, and that is a great sign. You can pick up on MRI that the palate has already been invaded with the mucor, and you have to plan this, you know, removal of the palate in your uh, the, the surgical process. So palatal involvement has to be picked up. These are the areas which can be easily missed. Another example. and you have to see on contrast mri again on contrast mri see this can you see the difference the non enhancing area and the enhancing area of the palate can you see yes see the disease on this side see the mucor on this side and see the palate is already invaded non enhancing area in the palate can you pick up this can you appreciate this yes and this is how you can plan the removal of palate which may not be obviously you know assessed by other means pre operatively you can't assess many a time unless you have a palatal you know s char or a palatal ulcer and many a time many a time it can be overlooked on clinical examination which mri can pick up early and you can tell your patient for the need of possible palatal reconstruction uh, later on uh, uh, now the involvement of the soft tissue areas this is um, the very very important scan by means of which we can plan our surgical approach accordingly like there are certain areas where the open surgery is required now look at this this patients i will show you the picture of this patient whose uh, disease had invaded the facial soft tissues nasal ala eyelids the orbital contents from outside everything invaded by the mucor see everywhere everywhere the airline and everything involved completely involved see the soft tissues the anterior wall of the skin and everything all involved along with the eyelids and these are the candidates for the open surgery orbital exenteration as there is already huge disease in the orbit rather than a sole endoscopic approach to give a complete clearance so your radiology can tell you what exactly need to be done and mri by means of you know so much of you know information so much of sequences variety of sequences give you complete info look at the orbit again orbit on this side and orbit on this side now achish is coming to your question early yes. involvement 
with the vision intact what to do see this 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 side grossly gone completely gone and this side early involvement orbit oh yeah hmm. see this is inside already inside orbit but the vision is completely intact look at the optic now look at the optic now on the other side now what to do how to take a call whether this um, other eye can be saved or not diffusion diffusion will tell you what exactly is happening see on diffusion there is an infarct in the optic now on the other side and the infarct developing in this optic now the patient has mild diminution of the vision with minimal involvement of the orbit with an early infarct developing in the optic now even if you try to preserve such optic now the patient may not be able to uh, preserve the vision and vision is most likely to go along at the early infarction is already developing so such patient where the vision is already gone on one side lost the vision on one side the other side clinically vision looks good but inside early infarct is happening you have to be very very you know uh, important uh, particular in counseling the patient in spite of all odds you may not be able to save the vision otherwise post operatively if the patient loses the vision he may you know blame you for this you know complete blindness so you have to be very careful always always get the diffusion weighted mri done to get a complete information of the optic now what my point yes, yes very nice thank you see how mri is now what information you got from the mri how much you get from the ct scan let me show you this is a ct scan of a patient let me show you this is a ct scan of the patient uh of a mucormycosis patient now see what is the difference in this ct scan from the ct scan of a plain simple sinusitis patient yeah <laughs> what how much you can differentiate from the ct scan how much the optic nerve is involved how the orbit is involved whether you can save the eye any infarction involvement of the bone involvement of you know uh, other areas this is practically impossible so the ct scan gives to me just nothing as good as useless to get a ct scan unnecessarily subjecting the patient to radiation before mucormycosis surgery there is no point it will not give you information whether how the pterygopalatine force i see this opacity there that doesn't differentiate whether it is enhancing non enhancing mucor simple inflammation sinusitis what exactly it is so it is as good as useless uh, information you get from the ct scan now another areas the drilling into the sphenoid drilling into the sphenoid let me um, show you uh the I want to show you one more scan before we proceed to the surgery uh, that is a very very important uh, you know information we get out of that anyway i can show you in the other one now, how much drilling is required into the sphenoid what exactly the drilling required in the sphenoid the level of drilling required in the sphenoid is very very important now otherwise you know the principal cause of failure of this surgery principal cause of poor prognosis is the necrotic bone left behind the bone which is undergone osteomyelitis by means of involvement by the fungus which is lacking the vascularity which has no penetration of the drugs now and if you leave that bone behind that bony osteomyelitis there is a uh, nothing you know you can say uh, that you can save the patient see this this is a huge disease huge disease with a huge necrotic areas into the sphenoid 
this is a carotid sphenoid huge necrotic areas and this invaded bone is hyper intense if you leave that bone behind your drugs are not going to penetrate and this is certainly what you can see the prognosis you can expect is a very very poor prognosis for this patient so leaving the necrotic bone behind in spite of doing a good work is not going to help you so this particular surgery in the mucor mycosis requires a complete complete excentration of the necrotic tissues particularly the bone particularly the sphenoid bone the parts of the sphenoid bone which are very frequently involved the pterygoid the sphenoid floor the you know the the greater wing of the sphenoid all those areas are very frequently involved are most difficult to remove you must assess with the mri what all need to be removed what all need to be left behind and according to the competence one has to take the case and tell the prognosis to the patient see the normal sphenoid wing see this is the temporal lobe of the brain and in the base what is that on the normal side greater wing of the sphenoid greater wing of the sphenoid being black on normal contrast administration okay now on c the greater on the wing of the sphenoid owing to the its content that is bone marrow which appear bright on t2 weighted normal side i am showing you normal side normal side on t2 bright due to bone marrow on contrast dark due to non enhancement now you see on the opposite side what has gone see on t2 the entire bone marrow is gone and it's replaced by this disease right up to the most lateral aspect when you are going endoscopically you have to go right away there until the temporal dura to drill off this bone completely otherwise it is not going to help you whatever surgical work you have done so you can assess with the uh, mri that how much the drilling is required how laterally see this is the temporal dura and this greater wing of the sphenoid is completely invaded another thing the involvement of the dura this particular patient look at the dura on this side see on contrast and look at the dura on this side see this dura it thick and enhancing can you see the temporal dura yeah yeah very good and see the temporal dura normal and this is the fungal meningitis developing involving the dura why it is important in any meningitis case may not be fungal in other meningitis case or we intend to give our you know uh, injection for at least 3 to 4 weeks for complete clearance of the disease from the dura infection from the dura and here in cases which develop fungal meningitis you are at the mercy of liposomal amphotericin b and this is the indication where the amphotericin b need to be administered for almost a month in other situation where we operate in a regular case when the dura is not involved and if you have done an adequate clearance of the necrotic tissue you practically don't need amphotericin for more than 7 days in most of the situation you don't need more more than the 7 days so patients unfortunately in this crisis of you know non availability of amphotericin b there are certain you know lack of guidelines which has uh, you know worsened this crisis of amphotericin b non availability because many of the patients are receiving amphotericin b in icus in other non surgical setting for weeks and weeks without removal of the necrotic tissue and that entire amphotericin b is going you know complete waste then non removal of the uh, you know necrotic tissue completely if you don't remove the necrotic tissue completely and want to cover with a long administration long duration administration of amphotericin b is never going to work it is the most uh, wanted thing is a complete removal of the necrotic tissue so the need of the amphotericin would be would be less and less rather than administering for weeks and weeks this is the only indication where amphotericin b is required to be administered for more than 3 or 4 weeks to completely resolve the fungal meningitis which is ominous otherwise so there are these are uh, certain highlights certain points you can assess on mri of every patient 
you must get all these sequences done on the dvd and touch upon all these issues separately to have a complete work of mucor mycosis patient before you plan any treatment surgical medical so that you can uh, give the optimum results and you can prognosticate the patient properly so you must sit at least in half an hour uh, with the mri for every patient to get the complete information otherwise the, this the treatment will be full of surprises you will find that i have under the misconception that done an adequate clearance and this is this disease is so bad this is coming back again lack of proper work up is the principal cause of failure in this particular surgery in particular disease anything ashish you want to make before i start or do i go with the mri further and i think it is enough no no no, no. let's start the surgery because uh, dr satish can i ask something yes please sir uh, yeah i am dr prakash munka what i am asking is you stressed so much that mri mri and that to uh, get a contrast sir i am not manufacturing mri machines sequence. it is important for patients <laughs> yeah yeah the distinct no, why are, my is question given is by different. the mri is um, amazing exactly i agree 100% and have been listening you since couple of days now tell me the people who don't have access to mri because ct is hardly inadequate in information mri not only gives the structural but ct as well as the is as good as useless as compared to mri yes And so the people who are working at with a lack uh, of information, lack of workup, yeah, one cannot expect good results. That's why in literature, many of the literature, you know, the mortality rates are up to eighty percent. That is the literature where mm -hmm. the MRI was not even mentioned. What can you expect in the terms of results? So eighty percent, I would say, it is almost it is almost hundred percent certain mortality if the proper workup and proper clearance is not done. I think so, this right. disease, this disease has a hundred percent mortality if the patient is not treated, as good as as simple as that. So, so we can mortality. safely make this statement that MRI Dr. is Sateesh? a must in all cases before taking up for surgery. Yes, yes, that's that's yes. what uh, the, the actual workup is. Okay, that yes. is the doctor Satish. Can I ask you one yeah. question? Please, please. Doctor Satish, this is Gauri here. Yes, Gauri. Doctor, everyone recognizes yeah, your voice. Melodious <laughs> voice. Har <laughs> gunai. No, I wanted to ask one question. That Please. after doing MRI, after doing adequate clearance, and now we do not have uh, amphoteris in uh, in at yes. our hospital. Yeah. And. See, at least for two, three days or five days, we are yes. not going. To be. Let me tell you what we have been. So, doing. how do we manage this? Should we repeat the yes. MRI so, again? So, I would say that is a different aspect, the medical treatment aspect, and we are uh, going through difficult times where you know the Sanjeevni booty, the liposomal amphotericin B is not available freely. So, what can we do in these times? Number one, now the surgical clearance has become more important. Number one. more and more important number 2 number 2 you can use the other preparation which are not having that much of penetrance as compared to the liposomal amphotericin b like deoxygenate and lipophilic and an other preparation of amphotericin b is still as uh, some uh, having some value along with other drug posaconazole so a dual combination can work to some extent can No, What Satish, I am asking you. After that, we are not getting even. And after some time, post-operatively, we, you know, we are focused more and more on topical application of amphotericin gel to all those areas, all those uh, inflamed areas, no, to work to some extent. That's what you can do. But one of I will uh, take this opportunity are, to say do uh, not use moriconazole or mycofungal. And since yeah. we are not getting amphotericin, we are discharging the patients. We are calling them back for follow-up. They are just doing douches. Nothing else is available yeah. now. So Gauri, you can uh, see the. So after the how other, many days we should markers? Yeah. Yes, the other preparation of the amphotericin B are still available. Posaconazole is not um, as difficult yeah, as liposomal to get. Difficult to give it in diabetics. Yes, yes, and the all can all these patients are almost always diabetic. No, I have. 
Yeah. And the third thing is the isobuconazole yeah, in the certain patients. They have renal problems. Start the surgery yeah. and answer questions, please. Yeah. So isobuconazole is a good drug. Crisemba, very popular. Can be given even to the renal patient as it doesn't have renal clearance. It is quite reliable, you know, as far as the competence is concerned. Not as good as liposomal amphotericin B. But yes, in this difficult times, you can use an alternative with some combination. You can use Crisemba with posaconazole as a combination with more and more emphasis on complete clearance. There is no substitute to complete clearance. Even if you have liposomal amphotericin B, that is not a substitute to complete clearance. Correct. My question is, should we repeat the MRI if we are not giving any amphotericin? After our clearance, yes. after how many days we should yes. repeat? So I mentioned the last time also, there are certain criteria we take into account to order a repeat MRI. Number one, the clinical course of the patient. If some new clinical thing developing that wants you that the disease is progressing, you might have left behind or the drugs are not working or whatever, the disease is progressing. That is number one. Number two, your endoscopic picture in the post-operative days, if some more necrosis is happening, some more new areas are being involved. Number three, your inflammatory marker is rising in spite of all treatment. Your CARP is, uh, you know, constantly shooting up. So these are the indications to order a MRI to see if anything is left behind or new thing has developed and you can consider or repeat or a revision surgery in those cases for more complete clearance. So there are definite indications for, um, you know, repeat MRIs, but based on all these endoscopic inflammatory new symptom, new signs and all these markers rather than indiscriminately unnecessarily ordering an MRI. Many of the patients or CRP has gone down below 10. There is no point in doing anything. Just forget about the MRI. Any okay. more questions? Go ahead, Satish. Go we'll start this. Okay, session. so in a couple of minutes, um, uh, we are uh, coming back with the endoscopic picture. On meantime, we can take questions. I see you want to we say. We can have Sethi sir's opinion, the big boss, grand teacher of, teacher all, of teacher. including us. Big boss, anything to say? Any any advices or anything? Do's or don'ts? Regarding MRI or anything? Uh, no, Satish, excellent uh, uh, presentation. I mean, you uh, really crystallized it all. Um, uh, it all? I think uh, everything that you said can actually be crystallized or condensed into a sort of a checklist, you know, which can make it easier for people who are not very familiar uh, with MRI scan to go through it systematically looking for the signs of mucormycosis. For example, you can start off with the nasal cavity, look at the inferior turbinates, give the sequences like T2W sequence, um, uh, which is a uh, fat suppressed and um, the uh, T1 weighted with contrast and what to look for. So first, first of all, look in the nasal cavity, look at the turbinates, look at the signs of mucor and then look into the uh, sinuses, paranasal sinuses. And then like you mentioned, uh, in, um, uh, in uh, particularly the infection, a mucor infection can spread out of the bone uh, where the infections are concerned. So you look at the parasinus, uh, parasinus areas, uh, then into the infratemporal fossa, then the uh, uh, pterygopalatine fossa in a very systematic manner, according to the involvement, the common involvement areas. So, and the palate. Then after that, you know, you can look at the um, uh, orbit, uh, retrovulvar area, optic nerve, and go on to the cavernous sinus. So maybe this can be done in a very systematic manner so that the person who's reading it uh, can do it, uh, you know, sort of more systematically and uh, read it adequately. So that's the only information, um, uh, I mean, uh, uh, comment I have. Uh, so very nice. I mean, you have wealth of a material here. I think you will never find this kind of material in any book. And what I've learned in the past three, four days about mycormycosis, I couldn't have found it anywhere, but uh, in the library of Satish Jain's uh, webinars. So thank you very much. Thank you, Seti. It's uh, always a great pleasure to hear you. Um, uh, to answer you further, Gauri, uh, one should resist the temptation to give the other uh, antifungus like mica fungin, like uh, oriconas also on and so forth. And also the good emphasis on uh, anticoagulation is a must. 
not by using your usual eco sprints but by using anti tna inhibitors like uh, rivaroxaban or apixaban the another point that one should also not neglect to mention is the fact that during this uh, the, the use of if you have intracranial spread and you have uh, you can use deoxycholate amphotericin along with cascopungin that can be used it is known to have a good uh, synergistic effect and uh, so it's very important also not to use iron chelating agents there is this false idea that by using iron, because mucor requires iron to grow therefore people have used iron chelating agents but there are n number of studies that have shown that desferioxamine has actually increased the mortality following its use during mucor cases so uh, iron chelating agents also should not be used boss this free iron is available only when there is hyperglycemia exactly so the sugar so control is a priority sugar. rather than targeting the iron so sugar control in these patients see the control or the treatment of the underlying cause is most important thing and in these cases are hyperglycemia so are yeah. you getting the endoscopic picture yes we got the endoscopic picture see this patient the left eye the huge left cellulitis eye see. see left eye of this patient has been in uh, as involved i have shown you on mri Yeah, yeah. remember which yeah. requires orbital clearance orbital apex is completely necros i have shown you on mri so yeah. this is the red you know the proptosis and you know the globe is normal the you yeah. don't see the eyelids globe all are normal there is no fun in you know doing no point i would say criminal to do an orbital excentration in such cases yes so orbital excentration is certain indication i have already mentioned now this is the initial decongestion we have already seen this necrotic area on the lateral wall can you see yeah which we saw on mri as non enhancing area see this absolutely black okay. turbinate black turbinate that is the initial thing see turbinate middle turbinate behind involved yes so early pick up of this disease is the best way towards cure so majority of these diabetic patient who get this we need to come, we need to make them aware if they develop any excessive crusting you saw the crusting there yes any excessive crusting in the nose in a diabetic patient you are it should alert you with mucor mycosis uh, underlying uh, in that particular patient the reason is this lack of vascularity ischemia causes the crust to form and that is the principal earliest presentation of this mucor mycosis you can pick up which is the best time to cure these patients rather than uh, spreading after it has spread to the orbit or to the cranial cavity so surgery. this is the initial so now my surgery's goal is very clear removal of the necrotic areas and at the same time i need to go to the laterally to the infratemporal fossa this disease as a affinity to spread laterally to the pterygopalatine infratemporal fossa areas orbit so i need to have a good paramedian access not only for the surgery but for the uh, post operative surveillance as well so my first uh, you know uh, approach or uh, the work start with with the modified dankers the stunman canfield approach to access to the paramedian area which opens up a gateway to the paramedian skull base so this uh, dankers we have discussed n number of times is uh, again the same thing we are going to do is simplest of all approaches to the skull base particularly the paramedian skull base it opens the gateway see what i am doing this is all necrotic so i am removing this uh, you know the mucoperiosteum with this our preferred tool this is coblator and quickly i will finish this danker i know we are uh, you know running behind the schedule i uh, half by half an hour so i have to finish it in time as well we have some excellent talks today by our guest speakers on important issues see this pyriform aperture yeah nice you see the edge of the bone here yeah. pyriform aperture important to go all the way down to the floor yeah yes you have to assess the floor thoroughly for the palatal involvement 
which is not uncommon i would say and this all tissue can be easily debrided you can see this all necrotic tissue yeah. yes. see all invaded by mucor one should get used to identifying a mucor after some time what is normal tissue what is abnormal involved tissue what is enhancing what is non enhancing one should get used to see this is all mucor now will you do a frozen to reconfirm your diagnosis yes yes that's why i have taken the sample for the frozen that is the best test he will get a report in half an hour so a lot of people talk about the therapy without a certain diagnosis if you really want a certain diagnosis it is a clinical history the endoscopic picture is good enough most of the time to establish the diagnosis but still if you want you can take a sample and send for frozen section in half an hour you will find the kind of this classical broad accepted right angle branching fungi which is classical for mucor mycosis pata nahi so in this funny see this is the piriform aperture now i'm going towards the anterolateral wall raising this perios many a time this subcutaneous tissue is involved see this branch of the anterior superior alveolar nerves and vessels which are severed while raising this Yeah. Yes. Periosteum. So this is the anterolateral wall. Now, at this point of time, see in this Denker's approach, you are not supposed to enter into the orbit at the beginning. So our limit is the orbital floor. So we must make at this point of time where the orbital floor is to stay on the safer side. Pocket now. Okay. See, this is anterior wall. I'll do something to it. I can coagulate this to improve my field, and at the same time stiffen this wall so it doesn't collapse easily. See this? Now yeah. drill. Now this is our favorite MRI drill. Now the newer version of the stylus, just to. make an opening into the maxillary sinus and to define the level of the orbital floor simply see i am into the maxillary sinus now perfect to over cut let me show you where we are see the inside of the maxillary sinus yeah yeah we can see very, very clearly very clearly inside of the maxillary sinus and see the level of the orbital floor that is what we want to ascertain by means of this opening here yes so that we do not enter into the orbit accidentally while making this approach you know yeah so you can reach right up to the level of the orbital floor there a drill there retract and retract how far latitude does one uh, drill sadish yes depending upon your need you can remove the entire anterolateral wall you can easily go up to the v2 the infraorbital now and now with the you know the technique described by paul casanova you can transpose the infra orbital now and go around even further acha you can remove the entire anterolateral posterior lateral wall after transposing the infra orbital now so laterally no limit depending upon the need depending upon your lateral extension required you can easily remove this uh, you know wall up to anywhere you want so this should be loma special transposition you can so this is the basic approach and now i'm thinning this wall so i can easily punch it out see i can see my roof there yeah yeah very clear now give me first debrider see 
see my level of the orbital floor can you see yes yes much better some polypoidal thickening inside the maxillary sinus not very important that is reactive right that's not the disease at all yeah that is because of blockage and now this the only important structure now we are coming across in this approach is the nasolacrimal system yes so now suction gun bol raha hai see this i can punch out this wall after thinning it and directly reach to the level of the nasolacrimal duct this is much easier way of you know faster and efficient thin it out and then punch it out that is our nasolacrimal duct coming up yeah yep so you can punch out this wall so there are many ways to do the same thing you can remove by the drill slowly you can use a gaussian hammer according to the availability and instruments and how you are used to drill uh, sorry remember in the earlier days satish you used to use a gaussian hammer yeah i have tried all that is much faster you can say little crude but much faster way of doing that see the nasolacrimal duct here yeah yeah this one yeah and inferior terminate is necros yeah already necros see your diagnosis most of the time is confirmed by and large by means of nasal endoscopy this can you have no crust on the turbinates at all and still have the disease either in the palate or in the orbit yes 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 it can be being endoscopy is but like not so common not, not so common very uncommon no yeah see the middle turbinate yeah so no, no, so i want to ask the question the other way around a nasal endoscopy would definitely give you a clue it yeah. cannot be that you miss it it is not 100% sensitive no. you can say but majority of the time you get the information from this only because now yeah. with now drill drill complaints coming See, th this is my nasolacrimal duct yeah what i will do now jorak see the duct i want to cut it sharp right at the level of the orbital flap so it doesn't uh remain there hanging and doesn't get fibrosis the epiphora is uh, quite disturbing otherwise in the post operative period this the bone really gets very really hard here no thick and hard See the level of the orbital floor. Drilling this bone is the most precise way of you know carrying out. Yeah. Yes. This step. The uh, it must be emphasized that the cutting of the nasolacrimal duct should be flush. with the roof with yes, the orbital yes, floor like, with your okay. bed panch minute ho gaya
you don't drill through because you're afraid you'll damage the duct completely therefore you go to the punch yeah you can thin out the bone and see this yeah yeah, yeah beautiful yeah you can see the groove for the duct you can do the way you are comfortable with you are used to no big issues for the do you know this nasolacrimal duct is formed of three bones more importantly the frontal process of the maxilla then the lacrimal bone and the lacrimal process of the inferior turbinate so all these constitute this nasolacrimal duct so this bone has to be thoroughly remove the brider how is the picture Good. excellent Good. yeah look at the level of the orbital floor yeah yeah, yeah. Oblator. Time is spent in this approach actually saves not only time but the overall patient because this gives you amazing visualization pre and uh, per and post operatively. A lot of people have a little bit of a reservation. They feel this is an overkill, but I think for mucor, I think this is the most deserving and appropriate approach. Yes. Especially in a pandemic where now you want the post-operative examination to be brief and complete, complete and brief, the other way around. Ashish, there are so many factors contributing to the so-called high morbid mortality in mucor mycosis. Yeah. Not a single factor which is there. So there's so many which which actually are preventable or are grossly could be minimized. Yeah, drill. See my nasolacrimal duct. Yeah. yeah. I have also ordered the new MR8. Satish coming on Saturday. Pardon? No, no. I have also ordered this new MR8. This at piece. MR8. Yeah. Okay. This drilling is important one for the NLD and also now to get access to the orbit, no? This access, yes. 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 Yeah. You have a full access wherever this disease can go. It has to be flushed. Sometimes full access by default. Full access for all possible. Yeah. Finish. Yes. 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 Completely flushed and cut. Yes. So now there is no obstacle. Drill for uh, the brider. Now there is no obstacle. Very nice. See, we have to expose the orbital floor Correct. It is as well as the medial wall completely. I will show you the complete exposure later. Yeah. To enter into the orbit and clear it efficiently by endoscope. Yeah. And micro debrider will be the key tool for the actual debridement. 
זה קצת יותר למדע. See my pellet mucosa is healthy. Can you see here? Yeah? Yes. See the maxillary floor mucosa is healthy. Yeah. And I could see on the MRI same that pellet pellet need not to be removed. Uh, and uh, that's a very vital information I would say. Yes. Get on MRI. What is the situation of the posterior septum? Any idea? Posterior septum is probably I have. Um, See, difficult to appreciate from MRI unless the bilateral mucosa is involved. Yeah, but visually oh, no. uh, it becomes vascular. But in such cases with a unilateral disease going up to the orbit, going up to the skull base above, all turbinates involved, it is better to remove the posterior part of the septum at least. Yeah. So we will thoroughly analyze the septum. So if there is a cartilage we'll, on one side, can you just remove the pericondrium on one side, or it's always best to sacrifice? Uh, let's see how it turns out to be once you start removing. Not in this case. If it is, I'm asking. Yeah, if it is thoroughly healthy, we can preserve the opposite side, pericondrium. The wash. So this is the initial picture after the. Dankers, okay. Yes. Yeah. I had a case presenting as a septal abscess. Sir, she okay. turned out to be mucor. I talked to you about her. Pardon? Yesterday's case presented as a septal abscess. Yeah, yeah. You told me. You had shown me. Yeah. Post COVID. Post COVID turned out to be mucor. So wow. We, we aspirated, sent it, and the then. The septum was involved by the mucor. Uh, suction wash. wash so what did wash. the MRI show, Ashish? No, so it was limited disease. It was mainly the septum. Wash. And actually the anterior sphenoidal wall. So we had to remove all of that. So this is a gross picture. Yeah, very nice. And now I will keep on going behind and remove the middle turbinate. Clear the sinuses. And that will open up. See this? Yeah, already yeah. everything dead. Yeah. All gone. Classical of mucor. This sequencing of doing the modified dankers first, without doing the pes beforehand, because it does not it prevents the blood from coming into your surgical field. So it's better to go from yeah. front to back. Yeah. And top to down. The top uh, down to up, sorry. Blood doesn't keep trickling in your surgical field. Denker is boom to such, you know. Yeah, yeah. Clearance, surgical clearance in mucor. And post-operative as well. Of it in the first wave uh, webinars that you did for angiofibromas, and I think that knowledge is now coming so handy to everybody for the dankers. People have seen it God knows how many times. The other day, like I said, I think you've probably done more dankers than Mr. Denker himself. <laughs> so tell us about the uh, you know, palate and artery and is there some Yesterday I spoke yeah. to you about it. If, if it is necros, does it indicate that the palate is going to be that much more? or See, is no that is the reason of the sphenopalatine artery. Yeah. yeah. That is the area. That oh, is the sphenopalatine okay. area. Yeah. Sphenopalatine foramen, you can see. Yes. And this is behind the posterior wall of the maxilla where it is going into pterygopalatine fossa. Now, you can... Coming to the ethmoids above, I'm still with a zero degree. See the ethmoids? Yes. yes. You saw on the MRI, everything was black. black. Yes. If you see anything on the MRI, everything black, get ready for the necrosis. Uh, 
how often do you find the cribriform plate also involved yes these days very often so what do you do then i strip gently the mucosa very very uh, staying very gentle to avoid a leak and if there is remaining i coblet that we have couple of intracranial extensions also we have operated hmm some patients are doing well some have some we have lost so that is the i would say the grave prognosis you can think of once the sad reality of the to the yes once it spreads to the csf circulation the prognosis is really bad uh, See now, wash, wash, wash. I'm. I will just finish my work with a zero so that I can change to seventy quickly after that. See, this is superior tabinet. Yes. which is also involved all has to go what is the bare minimum that you have ever done in a case how bare, have you had a chance to be uh, to intervene surgically bare minimal surgery yeah what is the bare minimum that you have ever got a chance to do yeah the same what i have done so far this much turbinates and little bit of the septum that's it that's it early cases but even there you would prefer to do a modified denkers only no yeah but my surveillance because this disease has a propensity to spread laterally oh. see in high percent of the cases Mm-hmm. the infer temporal fossa and the tergopeltine fossa are involved <clears throat> even everything is straight everything seemingly normal you know yeah the so post what... wall of the maxilla and all everything looking normal and yet you find involvement in the posterior lateral areas yes so this... how does it look in the post operative surveillance if it's coming back the bones yeah. necrosis how... you start getting the thrusting again yes necrosis necrosis okay sinoid sinus you see the posterior wall of the maxilla is looking deceptively normal yes that is why most people tend to stop here and hide the disease behind and i generally widen the sinoid in all cases till floor Floor. towards the floor so that i don't miss anything inside and you said the bone of this phenoid also can be yeah because in very commonly the floor of the sphenoid is overlooked it is involved in continuity with the pterygoid process that's why remember in all cases yeah and make sure to open this i have shown you earlier as well we don't do this in our regular sinus surgery no. i remember in one of these webinars you had to drill the floor of the sphenoid yeah the other day no he did i think you have to drill the climax so much So now, let me show you the sphenoid inferiorly. See the floor of the sphenoid. Yeah. Yep. Oblater. 
Now that's a very important area to inspect positively in all these cases. See, the failure in surgery is attributed to many things. The hidden areas which are overlooked. Mm. The bony involvement which is overlooked, that is most common. This marrow bone, once invaded by the fungus, has to be drilled away. Otherwise, no amphotericin or anything is going to work. What is, what is it? No? See, right to the floor. Yeah. Yes. This is your steroid process. Okay, this is one aspect. This is your pterygobeltine fossa. See this? Yes. What do you say, Ashish? Involved or not? <laughs> Without the MRI that you read, we would have said no. <laughs> Without the MRI, we would have said it's good. Magic no, box. Silly. <laughs> Magic box. It's the mucosa is bleeding nicely. <laughs> see this magic box. Yeah. Suction can now. Yeah. You can easily open this space. Yeah. Right. It has to be nice, wide, and big for you to get access. Otherwise, yeah. Just you have to everybody mark the level at which he does this. To keep it flush to the uh, inferior orbital wall, no, Sadish? Yeah, yeah, we will. As high up as you can go. We will. Yeah. Give me the carry some. Section. Can the look of the periosteum be a reasonable? Uh, yes, yes, yes. See this? Yeah, yeah, we can see the necrosis. Yeah. yeah. That is something important. And in all these patients, this area is very close to the orbital apex. Wash, wash. Dharma, no, no. Give me a serious disease. Yeah. A small vessel can be no palatine. Does the look of the periosteum change, Satish, or it's not a reliable? After this disease. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. So this is all necrotic tissue. Correct. And laterally, this is inflamed tissue. See this. All inflamed tissue need not to be removed. Only the necrotic components need to be addressed. Do you mind washing and showing? Yeah, yeah. Directly, yeah. This is V2. 
Yes. Yeah. And this is your vessel. Yeah. Okay. Okay. See the level difference. Yeah. Yes. Learner clip. So I will apply a clip to the most lateral aspect. Okay. Yep. Yeah. And this patient has a typical symptoms of V2, numbness and all that. See, the V2 is involved. Yes. And in such patients, most of the time we have to sacrifice this completely. Now see where exactly we are. Just open you to show you how close we are to the orbital apex. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. That is the apex of the orbit. I will show you the other structure there. Yes. See in the sphenoid sinus, this is your cella. Yeah. Here is your carotid artery. Anterior to that is a superior orbital fissure. And just below that is the V2. This is V2. Yes which is inflamed and involved. And just about that is the superior orbital fissure, the level of the orbital apex. Yeah. Involvement of the pterygopeltan fossa is not so uncommon curved. I told you. And the reason is its close proximity to that critical area, carison. I think by default, I think it's a good idea to say open the pterygopeltan fossa in Almost all cases. All cases, yeah. I will follow it. I will find only the inflamed tissue. And see, after this, behind would be the pterygoid process. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Let's clip. Let's See, this vessel is contributing. Yeah, yeah, there, yes, that's a branch there. <laughs> so, so, the, so these are Carl Storch clips. Yeah, we got them, yeah. So this really? is V2, which is gone by the inflammation. Yeah. See this? This is the region of the pterygoid and the beginning of the greater wing of the sphenoid. You have to thoroughly, radically clean this region, you know? Yeah. See the bone behind? Yeah. This is your median. Give me the drill. After that, I'll take the 70 to go up. See the clearance in this region. And you have to ensure a complete clearance under vision. Is that okay? In the last MRI, I had shown you about the greater wing of the sphenoid. Yes. You have to follow this bone. Just about that is the temporal lobe of the brain. Yeah. yeah. See where the foramen rotundum is. Hmm.
this is bad bone which i am removing you may be right see this disease has a special affinity to involve the maxillary the cool enough of later maxillary and the sphenoid bone it can involve the other bones it more it frontal also everything but these is special affinity towards two bones more and more clearance will lessen the requirement of intensive medical treatment hmm. the moment you start controlling the sugar levels does the rate at which this uh, mucor grows does it uh, reduce definitely but depends upon the hypoxic areas you know uh -huh. if you don't if you don't debride adequately yeah that gives the best uh, i would say hospitable environment for the mucor to grow in dead acidotic hypoxic areas See this marrow bone. Yeah. This is disease, Sadi. Yes, yes. I will drain it out for sure. It has to be, yeah, dealt with thoroughly. This you spotted on the MRI. Yes. that's why overlooking the involved areas without a good radiology See the video now. Yep. All the way. So if this would have been left behind, I'm imagining I would have left this behind because I would have not been able to see it. The patient would have not recovered at all. yeah how would your how would this area be treated just please see it again on radiology how does one identify this yeah yeah no no please see it again for me to yeah i will show you see the plate of bone coming now yeah nice the reddish bone coming now yeah, yeah. see this plate of bone yes. yes smooth texture yeah you can see you drilling and away this is my uh, you know vidian nerve is a guide to the carotid yeah the best guide to the foramen lacerum carotid See the clean bone now. Absolute clean bone now. See, this is our artery. This is a tergopelvian fossa. That's the carotid here. Median nerve here. Carotid would be here. Cella here. And then your orbital apex is here. Okay. Yes. Wash. Now I will change to seventy degree. to go up we all know the disease was going up and with this only we will uh, enter into the orbit to clear the orbit completely so which is the best area to always enter best which is the best location for to enter the orbit 
from the medial wall and inferior wall i will show you so where are you farthest from the muscles see this is the area of the orbital apex there mm. see the septum yes yes uh, after the last webinar you pointed out we started looking we stopped using adrenaline packs now we are only decongesting the nose with otrivin yeah because uh, to get the realistic we don't want vasoconstriction and things to start looking pale that's one thing we've changed for mucor then front to back and down to up that's we are see the septum involved yeah that's why i told you in such extensive involvements of the turbinates and the skull base we must remove at least the posterior part of the septum if you overlook this this is going to come back for sure we have seen in our cases earlier cases where we you know stayed conservative left the septum and then afterwards we had to revise them so this posterior most part of the septum then no? is the one which we are going to revise see the skull base involvement yes see the color is all oh my goodness see the frontal bone involvement see the bone yeah actually has a purplish hue i think this necrotis See this entire bone is uh, gone. Yeah. I told you it is going to the ethmoidal roof. You can see. Yeah, yeah, very clear. Anterior ethmoidal well. That's the post ethmoid anterior ethmoidal artery. You can yeah. see. Hmm. Does this get thrombosed also sometimes? Pardon? Does the anterior ethmoid get thrombosed with mucor? Bone? No, no, the anterior ethmoid artery. artery. Does yeah, it yeah. Thrombosed. Yeah, the, I don't think any circulation in this. Last time also I showed you the thrombosed. Yeah, you showed, yes. Yeah. See with the seventy degree hidden areas, the uppermost part of the septum was involved. One can easily miss. It's always interesting to look from down up. <laughs> so, do you remove the entire bony septum? Serious? Not really. It's not needed most of the time. Okay. But yesterday with my septal abscess, I had two, Sadish. Yeah, yeah. I'm not saying always, but most of the time we don't need to. See this bone? Yeah. I told you what we are going to find inside the orbit. I told you from MRI. Yep. And I will uncover that very soon. shows the best strategy of uncovering the orbit and how to approach the orbit in the most elegant way see before i open the orbit i need to address this bone otherwise my orbital content will fall in between yes and then it will and will create problem okay yes. so i had to address this to finish your frontal and uh, the complete clearance yes. for you yeah this frontal part of the one somebody was asking if frontal bone is involved sometime see the example so i'm back with 0 degree no need to rush but just letting you know it's 4 o'clock yes won't take long ashish Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. Once you open it, it's not going to fall. 
Then we also have Satish Nathan talking about the microbiology, and we have two top microbiologists cool. from the country, Dr. Sonal, who's going to present. She is quite a maverick. She's going to speak about the RT-PCR for mucor and uh, many other things that can be done. And the other person is from Canada. His name is Matt. He is the director of an institute of uh, mycology in Canada, and they have got uh, one or two cases. I forget. They definitely have one that I know, and uh, he will present his work. He's 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 quite renowned all over the world for his work on fungus. And we will, of course, with the. Yeah, I'm reaching to that frontal bone. Huh? Yeah. I'm reaching to that frontal bone, yeah. which is involved. Like we do Lothrops. You are removing the beak now. Visibly, it's impossible to tell it is diseased. Pardon? Visibly, it is impossible to tell. I mean, I don't think we have enough. a uh, visual memory of a deceased bone of mucor i can't hear you ashish said something yeah Did ashish I... said that uh, vis visually is very difficult to make out whether it's disease this part yeah, the bone the quality of bone yeah see that's why one has to get used to identifying what is good what is bad it comes see i changed to 0 degree and divided that frontal bone now see the area yeah yeah, yeah. yes healthy yeah yeah we can see the anterior third in the center of the yeah correct see the frontal bone area that yes. was bad i have divided and now it looks healthy the idea of this webinar is really to raise your bar of excellence you know you have to have these visual uh, memories in you when you are dealing with your surgeries when you are dealing with your patient this is what we have to aim for when he says complete complete and he stresses on that word complete so much i think just doing a, a namesake face or open the opening the maxillary on i think those are jokes for you for probably the mucor fungus is laughing. see now the entrance skull base clearance yeah that is beautiful complete entrance skull base you can see now yes barrel with it this part of the septum i know has to be removed as i already mentioned but let's go to the orbit here yeah. yes now we go to the orbit 70 ha oh, oh, oh. ha hmm. and again the, the the look and status of the lamina should not be mistaken to be assuming that the orbit is good right yes yeah now first of all i'll open up the floor ashish yeah see with my chisel light with my chisel mm. first of all i will open up the floor okay or tell tell me that if i say this fat looks good i have made a blunder right because i did not read this is the mri properly yeah so mri guides you everything yeah so otherwise at this point one would think the fat looks nice and healthy yeah see the peri orbita yeah all necrosed yeah. yes absolute white pale absolutely
So which is a point you incise the peri orbita? The debrider can start from anywhere, but mostly posteriorly. Now he is very clear because his MR reading and you know what he showed. Yes. No hesitation in his head. He exactly knows. So now he can be very aggressive. I mean. Patient is blind anyway, so on that side. Now, see, I am. How do I? How do I? First, I am debriding the periorbita. Yeah. See the necrotic tissue. Correct. Let me show you. See the necrotic tissue. Yes, yes, yes. We'll show you. For oh, sixty day. Oh, forty day. See the necrotic tissue. Yes. All necrosis inside the orbit. See, this is mucor. Yeah. Yeah. See the necrosis. Yes, Sadish. Yes. All rotten. Hmm. I'm wondering whether Oxer is back. I have to see. Now this Satish, you go by the feel. Now the tip is feeling the orbital. Yes. yes. Yeah. See, I need not to remove the muscles. Yeah. Anything which is you know, which is healthy, healthy. vascular. So now there, it all looks nice. Yeah. yeah. See this now? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. What is there? Oh God! Yeah. Oh, okay. All gone. All gone. See, you can. That is your optic now. That is your globe. Yes. I see the necrotic areas here and there. You know, the best part about this is what you do endoscopically, it heals up so fast. It doesn't give a visible depression in the eye from outside much. See the floor area. To the floor? Yes. Yeah. Everything? Yeah. See this necrotic area. Oh. You had cases with the orbit and the palate being involved? Pardon? Yeah, many cases. Yeah. No, okay, got it right. Um, let me take this opportunity to welcome yeah. uh, Dr. Yeah, yeah. Raj Bayani, who just joined us from the United States. Uh, he is the president of the Federation of Indian Physicians Association. Welcome, sir. Hi Raj, hi. See this necrotic region. Unmute, unmute. See this necrotic region. Yes. yes. See. Raj, you have to unmute. And uh, it's very kind of him to be fully up and about at 6.45 in the morning in New York. Beautiful, Satish. 
Yeah. Wow. Oh, so more. This is going all around the optic nerve. You know, all around. Yes, yes, all around. All around. See here? Yes, yes, yes. yes. And from here, see there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. See there? Yeah. Yes. All everything healthy? Yeah. So we removed only, only, only necrotic regions. See this necrosis? Yes, this, I was about to ask you that, yes. That's your eyeball? Yes, that's a globe. You see that being necrosed also? See now. Every nook and corner of the orbit can be visualized. See that? Yeah. Optic now, eyeball, the muscles. Dinesh? From this side as well. Please unmute uh, Raj. Raj Biani is just joined from New York. Hi, City, back. Welcome back, City. Please unmute uh, Dr. Raj. Dinesh, are you there? I'll tell him. Ashish, we are finishing soon. Yes, yes, I know. So, Sonal, I can see Sonal is also there. Uh, Dinesh, also unmute Dr. Sonal. And uh, I don't know whether, can they see Dr. Matthews? He's going to join from... See now the contour of the eyeball orbit, everything will remain. Yes, I mean, sir. maintained. So there's no cosmetic oh, deformity from the outside. Yes, divider, divider. See the eye from inside. Get fibrosed and doesn't give any problem and it heals so fast. As compared to the other areas, this globe heals faster. Yeah. The last thing left to us is the septum. Septum, yeah. Sonal, are you there? Yeah. So, Satish, we want you to listen to the microbiome talk intently and yeah, yeah. Uh, discuss it because I don't think anybody else has so much knowledge. Yeah, yeah. Five, only five minutes. I need only five minutes. No, no, no take your time. Take your time. No yeah. rush. No, what I mean is when, when Sonal is talking, yeah, yeah. Uh, we, we, yeah, yeah, we would love to listen to her. Hi, Sonal. Hi. Dinesh has not unmuted Ashim. Have you told them? Have you told Dinesh? Yeah. Both Dr. Sonal also. Dr. Sonal loves to watch surgery, so she's been... Microbiologist? Anything that she cannot see under the microscope, she hates. For the record, she doesn't need yogurt because she has microscopic vision. See, Ashish, this is yeah. our bone. Yeah. Yes, so they have, they have unmuted me, Ashish. And yeah, Ashim. Yeah. hi Raj, hi, hi. Thanks. So now we can hear your voice besides seeing you. Yes, that's so Ashim, right. Go ahead, Thank go you. Ahead and introduce Ashim is look, look at the globe again. Brilliant, Satish. Super. Oh, super. Absolutely. So top. Can you see this area? Where is that anterior model? That area. Yeah. Inside the globe, optic now. And more importantly, no necrotic tissue is left behind. That is the goal. In this case, where would you look for if you were to look for when you do the surveillance uh -huh. post -talk? Where do we? Where where would you pay attention in the in, in such a case when the debridement is so thorough? Yeah, around the around the optic now. Around. All corners of the orbit, particularly lateral to the optic now. And you would, if at all it was to come back or if it was to show itself, it would start showing as a crust in that region? Not really. Uh -huh. 
See, if you leave anything behind, the things will remain same. It will keep increasing. Now, this is the picture after this work. And now I will come with zero degree again to remove the part of the septum. Only the posterior part and upper part of the septum, which is more likely to be involved. In this case, we have seen the frank involvement superiorly. Yeah. See the posterior and superior part. This is the most common site which is overlooked, or the most common site for the gout system, for the residual, you know, disease. And this, this is the septum. This, this is, is the septum. Yes. Of, of the mucor in this uh, current times, no? More and more patients with the septum are... After you pointed out in the last webinar, we find it now. In almost 80% of the cases. Yeah. Anterior part is uh, almost always spared. Yeah. I think Except in, in more the middle turbinate, that's where I believe the whatever contiguous to the middle turbinate, and obviously the areas which have got necros due to the thrombosis of the anterior part of the Yes, yes. Vascularity. Yeah. Even the posterior nasal nerve and vessels are often involved in this. Now, I can simply remove, let me show you other tool, scissors. So in this case, I'm going to proposing to keep the perichondrium on the other side intact. So since the upper part was frankly involved, I'm not keeping. I get it. See this? Yeah. It is flimsy, yeah. Right up. What was that very high-tech instrument you used some time back? See, this is the simplest area to deal with. Not to leave any chance of disease in this region. This is relatively one of the simplest area. Yes. yes. But often neglected. Yes, that's what. See the opposite turbinates, absolutely normal. Yes. This part of the septum is really looking bad. That's, that's the last thing. Watch the dear dear dal darwana. Oh. Atisha, I just got a news. Uh, Central government invokes epidemic act for mucor. Which government? The central government invokes Epidemic Diseases Act 1897 for mucor. Our government yesterday has already applied, imposed. Achha. Rajasthan government imposed yesterday. I think it is what good I for... Think... A... You know, people, uh, the people in the administration govern and the type of technology, the type of consumables that are required, the coblet of wand, the debride of blades, it's, it's a very uh, expensive uh, affair to do a good job. I mean, you, you need technology, you need disposable. I think it's time they took notice that to do such a great and complete clearance is so much... This is, this is a matter of life and death. Life and death. And no, and no what I'm saying is I mean, in terms of what the ENT goes through or the investment they go through, this, this cannot be... Um... So it requires a lot of tools. 
lot good of camera a lot of cost good, uh, it's not about nobody thinks micro of divider coblator lot of disposable vans yeah the high the, speed drill yes and without all time some time not... navigation system for a deep you know extensive work particularly yes it will deal with the carotid good. artery cavernous sinus calvis it's a very very expensive infrastructure and uh, per patient cost yes satish without uh, all that is a compromise big compromise a big compromise you know bad i removed the part of the rostrum yes yeah see thoroughly visualize this this area I, should yes. not be overlooked see that's not floor yes yes Yes. i think it's a good idea to make a rule that if you have to remove the posterior part of the septum it's best to go ahead and yeah always always do that it is always good yeah and look at the sphenoid floor thoroughly yeah it is one area which can be easily ignored see now the panoramic view everywhere vascularity yeah yeah remember when we started it needs to bleed well yes everywhere we want this see the value of dankers yeah you can go inside the orbit and do anything you want to we leave necrotic tissues in the orbit the patient is going to die soon as it spreads to the skull base very fast i mean intracranial space tablet can you define that fast is a matter of days yeah yeah orbital apex is a port of entry to the intracranial space we can uh, it easily invades the cavernous sinus in no time see without this much of clearance even if you have lipo ample of liposomal amphotericin are not going to work yeah you will keep flooding they the they have to the they have to penetrate the tissues to be effective yeah and, and for that, that the tissue should be vascular typically your patients don't need more than 7 or 10 days when the debridement is so good yeah i rarely give beyond 7 days sometimes i don't feel yeah. like giving after 4 or 5 days but you know the disease is so dreaded by then your your guiding factor what's the end point of your decision the crp crp clinical okay. overall endoscopic picture i'm just asking is there a role for any microbiological end point i mean the end point can you take a swab again from somewhere and decide should you recommend a punch biopsy or swab yeah uh, in the immediate post op uh, period maybe after see, a week days also you have to direct by some means meaning means some clue from a seemingly normal mucosa here and there punching is not going to help you if you have any suspicion anywhere of course you don't have to think twice since the skull base was involved in this see that yeah i'm yeah. very conscious about i am with 70 now Yes. the upper part so this upper part is a hidden area you know this is the roof of the nose i would say and see how completely it is addressed now super what is your view on uh, putting uh, amphotericin gel in your pack yes yes we always now yeah this entire bed will be covered with the amphotericin gel and do you repeat that process on an alternate day basis or something repack yeah. on post operatively if you have excessive crusting excessive crusting is another thing uh, should be a suspicion for okay. some you know mucor growing below okay that is how it presents would you recommend using hyalase gel for better tissue penetration of the topical amphotericin along with it mm, not really was never done but this gel also is a very good formulation yeah we'll apply a pack but you know what happens in the critical areas you can apply directly udhana crowd mein laga ke 
सरिंज में लेके आओ। I will show you that gel in the syringe with a cord sucker or anything you can apply anywhere. This is Raj is asking about the role of hyperbaric oxygen in. Not really. There are some publications, but uh, you know it's not supported well yet. Raj, see this. See this. See this skull base. Yeah. What I can do now at this skull base, just to show you how you can, uh, you know, apply to the critical area. See this? Yeah. See, this is my gel. With the cow sucker. Very sucker's. nice and uh, thoroughly done. See now Satish. at the orbital Good apex, I am I am pushing at the orbital apex. Yes. yes. so all those areas critical areas uh, there could be a disease was at a high load you can apply this gel see this yeah let it remain in contact for a day or two give me 0 degree now or la na or la see how easily you can apply So this is liposomal amphotericin B gel again. See, this liposomes are. I think there's a glass piece there. Arranged in such a way on both sides of the amphotericin that it penetrates the lipid wall of the fungus well. So the penetration of the liposomal amphotericin as compared to the you know other combination other you know formulation is 20 times mm -hmm. see the lipo liposomal amphotericin b gel yeah 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 we can see excellent so it it is sticks well so we will leave it this pack for a day or two to all raw areas where the fungal was you know fungus was suspected i have i have uh, exhausted all my ways of saying you are the greatest and the bestest sita de outstanding brother bada mota de buddhi nahi hai Now see the lower part. Leave this in, uh, you know, contact is just suction there. With the key areas, in leave in contact for a day or two. The crusting will be minimal when you remove. Um, you know, see after a day or two. अरे सब कुछ है बुद्धि छोड़ के सब कुछ लेकिन और तुला दे वीरेंद्र ला दो सो सो फॉर पीपल हु डोंट नो सतीश इज प्रोबेबली डूइंग अबाउट 15 टू 20 केसेस एवरी डे He has uh, 52. The last that I spoke, 52. How many? How many patients admitted, Satish? Pardon? How many patients admitted? You are doing about 10 to 15 cases, 20 cases per day. Right now, around 50 plus. 50 plus people are admitted. Those who are operated, he has actually rented a hotel across the street, and there are 50 rooms that he's taken there. People are getting their IV amputation in there. So there is simply no place for. Uh, patients to be accommodated there. So probably the largest that anywhere in the world that this work is happening. They are very lucky to get all the ready-made wisdom and knowledge and expertise from this. How is the situation of amputation availability now? Zero. It is difficult. We are getting, but not. Uh, it is not predictable. As much as required. That one day dose will come, not come. Next day it will come or not. hopefully in another week's time raj things will be 
Uh, yeah, it will be solved. Before the crisis will be resolved in a week's time, uh, most likely. This is Raj. Formally, we have to tell that they probably sent thousands and thousands of uh, oxygen concentrators when Delhi was choking, and Raj was spearheading this uh, help coming from the US, from the American uh, no. community at large. I'm not sure it was. No. It See the final time. picture, and now we'll put a pack. Yeah, the pack is just arrows. No? Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. Master, thank you so much. That is a okay, very well always, job done. Right, to watch you operate. It was amazing work. Very nice. Ashish, work. last thing. There was a question. Yeah. To show on, a, uh, are you getting the MRI? Yes, yes, we're getting the MRI. From someone online that how do you differentiate an invasive and non-invasive sinusitis? Hmm. Only on MRI you can easily differentiate. Look at this. T2 weighted image in any MRI. See, this is the inflammation in the sinus. Yeah. And a non-invasive sinusitis where the sinus walls are intact, you will not find any sort of inflammation going out to the yeah. outside of the yeah. sinuses to any surrounding area. See yeah. the inflammation in the surrounding regions. See this? Yeah. With the bony walls intact. Mm. Complete intact bony walls and the inflammation going to the surrounding is classical for invasive fungus. Okay. You pick yeah. up the MRI, see the axial sections and see all around the sinuses. If it is non-invasive sinusitis, there will be no inflammation outside the sinuses at all. Mm -hmm. With invasive sinusitis, in spite of the intact sinus walls, you will find inflammation beyond the intact wall. That is classical of invasive sinusitis. Thank you. Now you can carry on. Lovely. So Thank now you. we have three of our eminent speakers, the guests today. Raj, of course, is there and uh, this, uh, Ashim will introduce him suitably. I was completing this that uh, Raj has uh, organized thousands and thousands of oxygen concentrators is what I know of. I don't know what other assistance these uh, uh, our Indian doctors in the US have done. So thank you, Raj, from all of us here for such a timely thing. And Mucor is also one of the areas where we'll collaborate with you if and when the time and need comes. I, I, before I let, let me say, Matthews has also joined from Canada. Matthews, hi. I'm not sure since how long you've been there and how, how much surgery you watched. And uh, we will speak about you in a short time. Yeah? Hello. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Go ahead with Raj and then I'll introduce Sonal. Welcome, Dr. Rajendra Bhayani. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. I know you've broken your sleep to be with us here. It's about 6.45 in New York just now. Um, uh, Dr. Bhayani is a renowned uh, medical professional, and he's also, not only is he an ENT surgeon, but he's also trained in neurosurgery and facial plastic and microvascular surgery. So I don't know uh, what aspect you left to the neurosurgeon and the, uh, and the plastic surgeons anymore, but uh, that's really amazing. And he has done a lot of work of improving uh, uh, the healthcare field. And he has won the American Trilogical Society Award. And if I go to see, enumerate all of his achievements, I think it will be the end of the webinar. But suffice it to say that we are very grateful to have him here. And he is so close to the Indian community of physicians in the United States. And he is also reaching out so professionally and personally to the Indian community back home to doing his bit to making sure that uh, he, he and his colleagues are serving our country, especially during this time of need. Uh, he's got so, so many other awards like the Bharat's Gaurav Puraskar, Delhi Ratan Award, Asian American Heritage Award, uh, so on and so forth, the Congressional Award, Achievement Award, and also he is one of the most influential leaders in the Indian community in the United States, and he's recognized as such. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rajendra, and thank you for joining us here. Thank you, Ashish and uh, Ashim, for inviting me here. It's an honor to join you all. This is uh, amazing work which you all are doing there because things are very, very difficult. And in spite of the enormity of work and resources limitations, the work you are doing is unbelievable and unparalleled in any other country in the world. And this mycormycosis actually has affected India so much. It's 
kind of mind blowing and and makes us really wonder why it should be so high in india as compared to the rest of the world because during the height of pandemic even in usa we hardly saw any patients so i guess uh, we need to carefully analyze and probably you guys can uh, if if you discuss earlier i would love to know why is it so high in india as compared to rest of the world and thank you what we are doing from here is whatever way we can because when we see so much difficulty uh, and so much uh, distress happening we just can't sit here and watch and be just sympathize in thoughts but we have to take some action to help our motherland and with that we reached out to several charitable organizations in usa and in india and then sent uh, ventilators and concentrators and pulse oximeters and uh, all these supplies along with we also pushed with the government to send remdesivir in fact we the indian embassy in dc is very closely working with us to make sure the amputation is coming right now everything which gilead makes is coming to india actually i i was about to get some doses but then suddenly government came and said they taking everything because mylan pharmaceutical is very close to us and also sipla both the vice chairman i talked to them every other day to see how we can get the medications and individual basis i have given few patient the tosi zumelab also if any one of you need on personalized basis because of government restriction i have not been able to give in bulk but certain patients we have been able to give as a behind the scene as a charity from the stocks they have uh, we also have telehealth platform and uh, that is uh, also picking up now we have joined ekal vidyalaya so ekal vidyalaya has 100000 schools in rural areas in india so the federation of indian physician association ekal vidyalaya will have a, what do we call as the community isolation center cics and uh, we are going to send them pulse ox and thermometers and blood pressure monitors along with some basic kit so at least if there is a isolation to be done in those schools which are in the rural areas can be achieved and in case if you have any specific way we can help you from here you let us know uh, so this is all we've been doing and thank you for this opportunity to interact with you uh, yes I think that's all. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. We know that you are there, and for Amphotrisin, if if at all, we know you are very very close to our Prime Minister Modi, and if we need you to whisper in his ears, we are going to use your good offices with the big man. Thank you so much. Thank you for thank you for being here. Great work. Okay. Great. Have, so why have... uh, just uh, Ashish? Just thirty yeah. seconds. Why is it so common in India than other places? Because... Any idea? Because um, two things, I think it's one is the indiscriminate use of a high dose of steroids. Covid <laughs> treating doctors are on steroids about steroids. That is, <laughs> that is how it is. I think that is one of the uh, establishable and a reversible uh, thing. We don't know whether Covid is doing something, but right now the Indian doctors were really on steroids and using it for prevention of the cytokine storm and things like that. so we've grossly gone wrong there and that's been acknowledged in public by the government that's getting reversed even as we speak there are di directives from the government to stop that indiscriminate or you know now on the hindsight an indiscriminate use of steroids that we believe in the next 4 to 6 weeks will show results and the numbers of the number of mucors will come down not just steroids but bringing in a good glycemic control maintaining the blood sugars now from day 1 to below 180 is what has been the guideline now and i believe that will also because covid induced hyperglycemia also needs to be controlled so sugar control at 180 and below i think that will will eliminate mucor or minimize mucor unless the covid virus is doing something else no doubt there is a talk about the indian variant of the covid virus the indian mutant that is uh, uh, particularly targeting the endothelium even more than the original virus and that could also be contributing because more both mucor hits the endothelium of the vascular endothelium so as the covid virus so there might be a synergistic effect so people are talking of better uh, thromboembolic control 
that anticoagulation for the longer period can we go to uh, if you don't mind can we have she's going to give a talk and then matthew is going to give a talk absolutely thank you so much appreciate all you all thank, thank thanks you much. thanks sonal welcome hi you can unmute yourself sonal is an eminent microbiologist one of the rare kind she is a medical director and founder of an of an infection lab it's the first and the only specialized infectious testing lab in india for last two years because she looks too young now but since last 2005 or 6 uh, she's been at it very very passionate about her work and everything else that follows is simply her ability to steal things up so she's an entrepreneur in her own right uh, made this uh, infection lab not gone public yet you know keeping it yet within her zone of influence but growing very very rapidly and without compromising on quality she was among the first few lesser known or a non chain lab to be given the rt pcr testing among the first ones besides the big group that speaks of the quality and uh, besides that uh, he has uh, providing services to clinicians in the field of infectious disease test, uh, testing her areas of interest being tuberculosis mycology syndromic panel testing and other molecular biology tests related to infectious disease management currently recognized as one of the most experienced personnel in india in this domain and she has and she would have won many a beauty contest but just because she did not participate uh, she is probably not one then sonal thank you for coming and please enlighten us about the microbiology in the context of mucor how is it that we can collaborate how is it that together we can help our patient the best possible and the fastest possible way go ahead sonal yeah thank you so much dr ashish for a very elaborate uh, introduction Uh, at the onset i would like to thank you for making me a part of your uh, community I, it's a very after a very long years have i ever seen a surgeon because microbiologist and surgery is two ends uh, here i would like to uh, i would like to take a chance to introduce uh, many more new things which are in the microbiology as regards to mucor mycosis so if you don't mind i'll just start my share uh, screen share yes. so uh, it says holistic approach towards diagnosis because uh, the title itself would say that uh, maybe it's not all the kwh mount is not all that is there in mucor mycosis there are lot many newer things uh, which we can explore uh, during these inspections now a muc uh, mucorails has been a very big group of uh, fungus which causes mucor mycosis so it is not just mucor it is a big group so there will be almost 77 species of mucor which causes mucor rails which causes mucor mycosis now uh, just to add on what dr raj bhayani had uh, asked the question that why is it so that mucor mycosis is so much prevalent in india and not in other countries i had a small data regarding the amount of uh, cases of mucor in us and uh, europe it was up to 0.01 to 0.02 cases per lakh population whereas in india that statistics is 14 per lakh and this is no non covid scenario so uh, maybe uh, the weather conditions in india is such which are which allows mucor to be there in the dust particles a lot and that could be associated with large number of cases of course with predominant diabetes capital india being the diabetic capital and uh, it is usually seen in diabetic hematological malignancies and trauma and now with covid everything is coming to the picture so uh, if we just go quickly on to the laboratory diagnosis of any invasive fungal infection there is a conventional way of looking at it so it would include your microscopy and culture which everyone knows about so i'll go a little details about these procedures uh when we talk of fungal stains today when we talk to ent surgeons they usually end up talking only about koh mounts right so koh mount is one of those tests we also have fluorescent microscopy which is much more sensitive than the koh mount because as you see in the picture uh, it, you can see these hyphae but these are very 
it needs a proper uh, observer dependent uh, test it is kvh so when you have to observe a kvh you also have to see whether it is a filamentous fungi what you would see is uh, a broad septate hyphae uh, sorry broad a septate hyphae which usually represents the mucoral species on whom it will not tell it is uh, only which mucor species right this is highly observer dependent uh my take on this is uh, koh should be used strictly as a screening test and never as a confirmatory test because when it will come to medical legal uh, cases uh it will uh when it it will come to medical legal cases it will be a trouble because you will need some uh, solid foundation of calling it a, as a mucor infection so that is where in your cultures come into picture Now, when it comes to culture, fungal culture is a mandatory as a confirmatory test. So, any sample picked up, say, late, uh, be it be a crust or a biopsy or anything, has to go in for a fungal piece culture along with the KOH mount. Now, mucorels are very easy to grow. They grow very quickly within twenty-four to forty-eight hours at normal temperatures, uh, and fungal culture will have advantage of you being able to speciate this uh, fungus, right? major concern would also be that if you mince the tissue too much it doesn't grow so there is the sensitivity of cultures is usually 50% now uh, where does culture play a role i will just put in two cases where uh, we found that uh, doing fungal culture helps now this case number 1 that is a 24 year old uh, male who is post covid and uh, he develops nasal sinusitis uh, and uh, post sinusitis uh, the, uh, on the endoscopy it doesn't look it doesn't have uh, black scarring or anything like this which is typical of mucorals and uh, he is being treated at home not given any steroids he is a non diabetic young boy now this sample is sent for a koh and culture the koh so shows high fake fungal elements is seen but it is not very evident you can see a very rare fungal high fake there and uh, the the ent surgeon is a little tensed because he needs to take a decision whether to go in for a surgery for this patient now when we just waited for a day's time the culture grew mucor mucor on the uh, plate now this gives a confirmatory diagnosis to help the surgeon take the call uh, regarding the debridement because as you all know debridement was the first step towards uh, management of the mucor uh, mucor mycosis so this is the first case the second case is about a 53 year old lady again a post covid case uh, she uh, also had uh, features of uh, sinusitis uh, on endoscopic feature there was a, a, a endoscopic uh, 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 the, you could see a scar like thing and that sample is sent to the laboratory we we'll look under the koh it shows filamentous fungi right on culture it is growing aspergillus right now though people are talking about mucor mycosis it is very uh, essential to understand that out of the samples that we have tested we have tested more than 30 to 40 samples in last 15 days uh, almost 10% of those samples are not mucor so uh, why is it so important because the treatment protocol for mucor and for invasive aspergillosis is different for mucor you would uh, try and prefer amphotericin b or posecanozol whereas the drug of treatment for uh, invasive aspergillosis will be voriconazol so uh, that's the importance of going in for fungal cultures now when it comes to identification their conventional ways i would not like to talk because those are very raw methods of doing uh, identification they would just grow it on a culture medium and look it microscopically and give the identification now we have much better things to do now there is something was maldetoff now maldetoff is a equipment what it does is it ionizes the proteins uh, using a matrix and depending on the time of flight uh, of molecular weight of these proteins you can exactly identify which mucor species it is now what you need is a very good library of information when you are using maldetoff Uh, such as brooker uh, maldetoff is one of the biggest library for filamentous fungi now the best part of maldetoff is time to identification is as low as 45 seconds now as against if you go in for a conventional way it would take 7 to 8 10 days uh, 
the second method is gene sequencing which was till now considered to be the gold standard it is again sequencing based on the its region of the uh, the mucor uh, it needs a, again a data by sequence but the problem is here you need a batch batch of test so you will need at least 10 mucor uh, species grown to do it and it would take around 7 days time for the reporting now in today's time what is more important is the uh, quick results now that is what is coming with Mal malditoff now uh, why do you need identification you have removed it removed all the tissue which was there and uh, do you really require to understand why to identify now let's see at the study uh, the most common mucor species which causes uh, rhinocerebral mucor mycosis is rhizopasoraceae uh, mucor uh, then less common is rhizomucor cunninghamella mycoclidus and the least is acinito my acai Asino mucor elegans, right? Now all these species. Why should we know that uh, this is the species? Because the most thing is uh, all these species respond differently with different antifungal agents. So it is not all the species respond to amphopy. There are species which respond better to posecanozole than to amphotericin B, and that is the reason identification becomes a mainstay when it comes to. laboratory management or evaluation of the patient now uh, just identification we also have drug sensitivity testing now are we thinking that all this mucor which is coming up and with the amount of amphotericin b that is being used there would be no drug resistance it is not so drug resistance in mucor my mucor mycosis is already being established in 2017 so this is uh, through why the old papers it says there is certain amount of drug resistance towards amphopy already there so how do we do this antifungal testing it is done by this mic method that is a micro prot dilution it takes only 24 to 48 hours to give a drug sensitivity report post a culture now it is important to track amphotericin b drug resistance because maybe over next 15 to 20 days it may start developing drug resistance and that is where we have to be very careful careful now uh, as far as i know there are only three drugs which can be used today that is amphotericin b posecanozole and as a vicuronazole now only three drugs out of which amphopb is most active on all isolates except for these two species now that is why i had referred to it that you need to speciate to know which uh, fungi it is now we work very closely with most of the hematology malignancy cases and post transplant cases and from from that experiences most of these surgeons the oncologist and uh, the bone marrow transplant surgeons they always speciate any fungus so as to understand the drug resistance pattern though i understand the physician will take care of these still the word on uh, drug resistance Posecanozole has a good activity against Cunninghamella. So, if you have this species, it is better to start posa instead of amphotericin B. Voriconazole doesn't have any activity, and there is one more drug called Terbinafine, which has shown good activity against Rhizopus, which is the most common Indian isolate that is there. Now, uh, in this scenario where you have only three antifungals, there are no new antifungals in line. there are no echinocandines which work against this and you have only a uh, few azoles like posecanozole and uh, the newer drug which is having um, some activity against mucor it is very uh, like uh, the the ent faculty which is there it is very nice if you can keep a track on the drug resistance pattern also along with the uh, debridement surgeries now let's go at the newer approach now you have in newer approach you have biomarkers and you have molecular test now most of the biomarkers do not work they are not uh, they they are not active in mucor so we will not consider it for now let's come to the molecular test now this is a slide which i used to always put in saying that pcr is the future but today in last one year pcr has become the reality of today with uh, it gaining so much of importance during the covid times now even for mucor you have pcrs available which are being already validated these are civd approved pcrs now what do these pcrs uh, target they usually target the uh, its region of the fungus 
and it would cover all the species. So when you call this mucor, it is a pan uh, mucor mycetes PCR, which will cover rhizopus mucor, cunning hemela, all the species all together. What is the sample that you can use? You can use biopsies, either fresh or frozen samples. You can use paraffin embedded blocks, which you send for histopath, uh, bronchial lavages for uh, pulmonary uh, infections, and also serum samples. I'll elaborate a little bit on the other specimens. Now, uh, yes, now what is the sensitivity of this? The sensitivity is as low as two copies per microliter. That means even if you find two filaments of uh, mucor in a specimen, this PCR is going to come positive. So it becomes far more sensitive than most of these uh, microscopic methods. Now, this is a study uh, done by, uh, it's from a Journal of Fungi, in 2019, which says mucoral PCR have been performed on fresh and frozen tissue samples uh, and on the uh, paraffin samples from the affected site post adequate pre processing. Both these samples showed good results. However, PCR results are better with fresh samples with a sensitivity of 97% to 100%. So I, I think there is nothing more than 97 to 100% uh, which can be given for any kind of a testing, right? Now, uh, uh, PCR from blood sample, a possibility. Now, where are we going towards? Now, we can do, of course, PCRs on the tissues that are being deprived and do a full range of testing to go up to the drug sensitivity testing. But uh, this is um, an experience shared from uh, hematological malignancies. So what it, in hematological patients, it has been studied that these PCRs are now recognized on as a non-invasive tool. So you don't have to go uh, take a punch biopsy or a nasal biopsy or the debridement tissue to uh, put in the uh, diagnosis of mucormycosis. It can be done uh, with blood samples. Now the study says as early as eight days before the mycological diagnosis, that is when the KOH comes positive or three days before imaging, that is your MRIs or CT scans, uh, you can get mucor in the blood. And that is our target to pick up mucor before it gets really invasive. As you all know, it is angio-invasive. So it invades all the blood vessels through the blood vessels. So that is the major reason why we should look at serum samples for early diagnosis of mucor mycosis, especially post-COVID. Now, these have a very fast turnaround time, specific and cost is much acceptable. Now, false positive is very rare because the sensitivity is almost 97 to 100%. Now, a short word on fungal biomarkers because like we said in our study, there is 10% of cases which are non-mucor. There's a other fungal. So if you have to quickly rule out if there is any other fungi which is circulating, you should do a beta D glucan or a BDG test which will quickly tell you whether it is an aspergillus infection or any other infections which are uh, combined. So uh, if I have to share a short uh, experience of our last 20 samples, which we did with uh, KOH mount and a culture and a PCR. So we had almost 20 samples under the study out of which KOH showed a, sep sep a septate hyphae that is very uh, typical of mycosis in 12 samples. There were uh, three samples in which there was a mixed growth. It's like you can see two kinds of fungi in it and uh, there is one sample in which you can actually see aspergillus, clear, clear aspergillus in the sample. And there are four samples which we could not uh, detect any fungi. When you do a culture, out of the 12, only eight could grow a fung mucor culture, right? And uh, PCR, all 12 of them were PCR positive. So PCR is eventually turning out to be a very good uh, confirmatory test because KOH will anytime remain as a screening test. When it comes to a very young individual to take a call on uh, major surgical debridement, that is where PCRs also play a big role. Now, uh, the cases which were mixed, say you have aspergillus or you are not very clear on KOH what it is, we had two cases out of which one was clearly negative for mucor PCR and later on on the culture it grew aspergillus. And there are four cases which KOH now found were negative out of which one PCR positive. So just to sum it up, uh, let's, uh, I would request everyone to just open up uh, the whole thing uh, 
diagnosis to a lot more tests than just going in for a KOH mount for uh, mucormycosis, at least put in a culture and a drug sensitivity testing so that uh, the drugs that are used can be really used uh, very efficiently. Now, this was a very small introdu introduction or a glimpse into that beautiful world of microbiology. It's always nice. Uh, thank you once again, Dr. Bhumkar, to give me such an opportunity. Uh, I would be open for any questions if there are any. Thank you to the beautiful world of microbiology from the beautiful yes. microbiologist. Brilliant. Just one question. Are you saying three days before, if we take a blood sample, we'll be able to uh, anticipate a mucor infection? Is that what you yes. said? Yes, it is being uh, very well documented in hematological malignancy. Can we do this test? Yes, we can do it here. So what we have is we have the whole facility of mycology, uh, mycology uh, right from um, your uh, just right from your cultures to Maldetov to PCRs to gene sequencing. So our kind of laboratories can actually do uh, these testing. Are there your kind of laboratories anywhere else in the country or you're the only one? Uh, right now, no. There are a lot of studies which are being going on at PGI Chandigarh. So maybe they would uh, shortly come up with uh, such things. Yeah. Thank you, Sonal. Thank you. Thanks. Sonal, what is the incidence of false negative with the blood? False negative incidence is not being noted down. The sensitivity is given as high as 97%. Mm -hmm. So very rare chances that it will come naked. So we probably need to bring this in the protocol for mucor now in the high risk cases. Yes. yes. So I need I need you to meet Dr. Oak and the task force. Yeah. If you don't mind, I think let's have Matthew make a comment and then Matthew, if there's something you want to talk and combined we could take the questions because I'm yes. not sure what he would like to say. So yes, Matthew, Dr. Matthew. Can you unmute Matthew, please? Sure, sure. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank you and, and the rest of the organizing committee for being here this morning uh, or this afternoon in India's time. Um, this is a real honor. Um, mucormycosis is a problem that, that you are fighting that also the rest of the world has had to deal with as this pandemic rages on. It's going to be a part of this. Uh, group. Do you have a mucor case in Canada? Yes, yeah. So we, we absolutely have. I actually saw a patient uh, last week with raging mucormycosis of the uh, of the leg, in fact, um, and um, this is not something that's unique to to India. I do believe that the steroid situation, as you mentioned earlier, makes it worse. Um, and probably the reason the rest of the world didn't see it during the first wave is that by then we we didn't know we had to use dexamethasone, right? The recovery trial results were only published in July, whereas the first waves of the world were really in the spring, and so we we didn't face the same uh, steroid pressure. We didn't have the same opportunistic infection, including invasive fungal diseases such as Mycorrhizae species. Uh, but we do are we are seeing cases now. Um, it's really quite dramatic, um, and this is something that we uh, we have to be aware of. Do you have any presentation? Are you going to make? Sure. I mean, I, I have. A, I wasn't sure what the. Um... Oh, sorry, I think there was a communication. No, no. I, I have a, a brief talk on. on... If you listen to Sonal, uh, is India up there where mucor is concerned? Is there something? Absolutely. I, I think anywhere where, where Sonal is, it's going to be at the tip top of the list. Um, what I would say is that I think the diagnostic considerations are, are true there like they are anywhere else in the world. Um, it's a very challenging um, fungus to to. Um, is there anything to that you're doing than what she has proposed? Because currently no. we're just taking that crust and sending it over. But no. even for us, it was a new thing to know that there's a do you think the, the, the blood test could, could anticipate a mucor? Yes, I, th I think there's a fair bit of data to support that. The one research tool that, that some of us are developing are breath volatile. So you breathe into a tube and you, you measure the organic compounds that are associated with mucorales, which is non-invasive. But otherwise, all the standard diagnostic testing is exactly what has been uh, described before. Um, and it is a very challenging bug to grow. Uh, and culture to identify the species is critical because we need to understand which antifungal is best suited for it. So I, I couldn't have presented it better myself. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you. Sonal, that's a big compliment coming from the director of one of the most premier institutes on mycology. So, so Matthew, we'll keep reaching out to you in, in, in this mucor uh, epidemic that we are facing. And uh, all of us in India, we look forward to any help that we can get 
in terms of the knowledge in terms of the tips like this was a very big thing and i think we will most definitely take it up and try to bring it into a protocol because right. as you what the one thing I'd say is, is you have a lot of amphotericin, I understand, posaconazole. We, we have had very good success with isavuconazole, which is available in Canada, in the United States, in North America, many parts of Europe. I don't know if India has access to it. That is a very useful drug. Um, it has many advantages. It shortens your QT for your cardiac patients. It has very stable drug levels, so you don't need to measure. Um, it is active against a broad range of fungi, as is posaconazole. And if you are able to have that as part of your armamentarium, I think that would be very helpful. Uh, we do have uh, isaviconazole with us, but uh, the question here is that there were some studies that says that it still is not the first drug of choice vis-a-vis uh, -vis liposomal amphobia. So um, oh. what is your experience uh, with the sensitivity profile between these two drugs? Right. So the, the, drug, the, the trial, excuse me, that um, first showed that isaviconazole was effective was the VITAL study that was done by Francisco Marti at Harvard. He's my mentor, uh, the late, great Francisco Marti. Um, and he himself, even though he brought the drug to market, he would agree with you. And he would say that isaviconazole is not the first line treatment uh, because there's a slightly higher risk of clinical failure when compared to amphotericin B. Now that said, there are patients who cannot tolerate amphotericin B for long periods of time, or if there's a drug shortage. And so what uh, we classically do is we almost start universally with amphotericin B while awaiting species identification and susceptibility testing. And then if we find that it's susceptible to isavuconazole or if the patient has adverse events to uh, amphotericin, then we will switch over to isavuconazole. Um, in your experience, do you have any, uh, have you seen any synergistic uh, effects with echinocandins like uh, caspofungin along with uh, itraconazole, I mean, uh, along with uh, uh, amphobi? So I, I was, this was part of the, the talk that I was going to, um, to show. Basically, there was a single um, study that came out of UCSF in San Francisco in the United States that showed that echinocandids in combination with amphotericin B were potentially better for rhinocerebral mucor. However, um, this was a, a, a non-randomized study. It was a retrospective cohort. And the data supporting this are really quite poor, which is the reason why in the 2019 Mucorales um, global guidelines that were spearheaded by Oliver Cornelli, uh, they recommend monotherapy with amphotericin. And if there's a concern for critical disease, they recommend pushing the dose, normally given up to five milligrams per kilo, but in critical cases going all the way up to 10 milligrams per kilo. Thank you. Donald, you have any question for Matthew? Uh... No. no, I have uh, a suggestion. I think uh, there was a question which had come from uh, you saying that during the surgery, if you want to choose whether uh, this tissue is actually uh, uh, a part of invasion or no. Yes. So uh, the, it, the solution could be a fresh frozen section like you take for any onco surgeries that you take a fresh frozen section and uh, process it for a PCR. So it would actually tell you whether this tissue is having new core or no. That could be one suggestion. If you can go fresh frozen to you for the PCR? Yes. And in how much time would you tell it? 45 seconds? Three hours. Takes three hours. Yeah. That's a little difficult, but then. And what is a 45 second thing? Can you tell us? What? 45 seconds, yes. That's a new technology called Maldi-Toff. Uh, not new, new in India. Newer? Uh, yeah, so what you do is once the culture is up, we culture usually takes 24 to 48 hours. So we pick up the filaments from the U core and we would uh, mix it with the matrix. So what happens is uh, this matrix ionizes the proteins which are present in the mu core and then it is run through a vacuum. Uh, vacuum. Uh, according to the molecular weight, these proteins will get dissociated and you read those patterns with the existing library and you actually can make out exact species which is present. Now the system which we, which we use is Brooker Malditoff. So they have a very good uh, filamentous fungi database. That's it. So you recommend we do this for as many cases as possible. Yes. Then you yes. can the drug because then we will have a real good Indian studies coming up uh, regarding to mucormycosis because uh, till now, never the cases were so high that in any a big randomized control trial could be done on a mucormycosis. So if everyone starts, starts sending samples just for a culture and sensitivity, uh, I think we will have a big big study come out, coming out of uh, these cases. 
Lovely. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we're going to reach out to you and maybe a small group with you and Sonal and you know uh, some some uh, ENT friends and some other people from the government. We'll sort of talk to you all uh, probably in, in next two or three days. I'll I'll reach out to you and uh, we will hook up and do something. Thank you so much. Is Satish there or he's gone? He's probably in the theater. Satish, are you there? Another case. Yeah, he he is too he's too prolific a surgeon. He probably has to finish more cases. So I think it's it's uh, Ashim. We can conclude. Yes. Thank you, thank you, Raj, Sonal, and thank you, Matthews, and thank you, everybody. I don't know if Samir is there. Whoever we've invited as the guest of is Oksa there? I I think there's something going on at the government level. because that message came from the cm about the epidemic mucor being uh, included in the epidemic thing so i hope and trust this was good for the mucor warriors the, the 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 surgical the mri especially and also i think now we need to look at the microbiology diagnosis very well she brought up the point of the medical legal fortunately we are not likely to be in that zone uh, dr sonali pandit has uh, developed a wonderful consent form from you core and i think it will soon get viral it is so nice that it will soon get viral and it should become a part of this that's more on the medical legal but to be medically very judicious and accurate i think we need to get down to what uh, sonal and matthews has recommended microbiologically not just have you core as a broad heading and she's right because the steroid or whatever we believe it's not selectively going to favor a you core it's going to be a whole range of fungal infections which are opportunistic who are going to find this change in biochemistry very very favorable so probably there is something lurking in the heart of my hearts the fear is the virus came in the form of covid or the fungus has come in the form of uh, mucor how far is the bacteria going to be as ents i am scared about a tremendous rise in malignant otitis externa we have been seeing uh, that have have you noticed that And that my question is out to the mucor warriors. First of existing infections of yeah. cholestyromas, you know, like in the first wave, we saw them actually destroying the labyrinth, and there is something which we could not, for short of time, uh, have uh, sonal, but into crystal ball gazing about how to anticipate the future uh, infections that are likely to come, and we hope they don't come, but that's something which sonal is going to be doing uh, at at a research level. now that we know that so many things can go wrong in this covid and once a person is infected with covid it really does not it does not end at 14 days not even 3 months i mean the the after effects are going to be long and for many months i guess i think another thought for the future would be restoration of immunity with uh, selective t cell and b cell activation and things like that that would be a thought for the future also yeah yeah so we have to look at that So thank you very much, everybody, for being with us. And thank you, Raj. Thank you for everything. Thank you, Raj. Uh, thank you for your inputs and thank you for being there. And uh, it was a pleasure interacting with all of you. And all the best to everybody. Thank you. Stay safe. Thank you. We can. Thank you, Sonal. Wonderful. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye. We can leave. Yep. cost will be what she wrote the cost will be inclusive with fungal cultures 2000 rupees okay please